I was very fortunate. I had a mum who used to really support me in that and, and push me in any sport I, I wanted to do. And we wanted to do everything at that time. And yeah, that's where my competitive background came from. Most people I've met in the industry, there's always a backstory to it. There's always either a self-confidence issue. That's how I started. That's why I started to do about self-confidence. Or there is, like, say, being bullied at school or they've had a traumatic time. Building this physique and getting this confidence. And it all comes down to confidence is, is why they got into it. There's so many moving parts and things that need to be taken into account to be the level that you're at and to get to the level where you get into. Before nine o'clock I'd had two big meals because my metabolism is so fast and I'm not naturally meant to hold this much muscle. I have to get up earlier to get more meals in in the day. And when it comes to like competing, you've got to live it. You've got to live and breathe competing. A lot of people think it's a 12 week prep and, and they're done. Whereas it's not, it's a lifestyle and you've got to enjoy the process. You've got to find that fire within yourself all the time yeah. and you've got to keep putting coal on it. You've got to keep stoking that yeah. fire. Otherwise that fire will go out. You know, if you focus on something enough and you want it enough, you'll make it happen. So that together we have clarity, direction, and success way beyond what we ever previously thought possible. Here's your host, Frankie Lee. First things first, guys, before we get started with this podcast, do me a solid favor and subscribe to this on whatever platform you're listening to it right now. Whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, I'd appreciate if you just hit that subscribe button and it lets me know that the content that I'm putting out for you guys is hitting your ears at the right time. Much love. This podcast is sponsored by contentremoval.com. So whether you're looking to remove any images, videos, search results, fake Instagram accounts, get in touch with us at contentremoval.com. Welcome back to the Frankie D podcast. Today, guys, this is an episode that I have been promising you. This man is an IFBB pro. He's a he's a top legend of the game. He's done bits at all levels of the game in bodybuilding. A really, really humble guy with a great soul. Honestly, I, I, it, just meeting him and having seen his YouTube presence and then, and then seeing him in real life and meeting him and becoming friends with him has just uh, amplified how real this guy is. Mr. Right. Ryan Terry, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I mean, I just, I, I wanted to say that because it, because it's all, it's all fucking true. I appreciate um, that. Thank you. No, cause you, you know how I have, I have, um, put people on certain pedestals in through my life at certain yeah. areas and then I've met them in real life and I'm like, fuck. Yeah. They always say, don't they? What's that famous saying where never meet your idols? Yeah. <laughs> because, because, because you, because if you, if you meet someone you, that you think of a certain way of and then they're not that way, it's yeah. kind of like, yeah, you might've met them on a bad day, but it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of what, it's kind of one of them things. Yeah. That's very true. Mate, you've achieved, when I was reading your accolades right the way through from, from the early 2000s of everything you've won at British level and international level and Arnold level and all that stuff I was reading through all these accolades but and we'll go into all that and and all that um the bodybuilding stuff but I kind of wanted to start really with 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 your childhood because I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of learnings that can be had for the audience in terms of and they don't really they probably haven't really heard about your childhood growing up and obviously you know doing your apprenticeship and plumbing and everything else that you've done before yeah. before you'd go and do all this so what was what did was it was there things from your childhood that kind of that kind of gave you the drive to want to go and do more to want to go and do bodybuilding and and, and all yeah. that kind of stuff yeah definitely so i was raised in a very competitive family uh, i'm the youngest of three uh, my brother was always into sports and stuff so that was straight away that's i fell into to sports from that just looking up to my brother um and yeah we were instilled to Whatever we took part in, we had to, to be the best at it or we were not very good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that was it. So I, I started, um, football was one of my main sports when I was younger. Uh, gymnastics, swimming, golf, and anything really. We used to do wakeboarding at the weekend. So I was very fortunate. Um, I had a mum who used to really support me in that and, and push me in any sport I, I wanted to do. Um, and we wanted to do everything at that time when I was younger. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's where my competitive um, background came from. And even my mum moved schools at primary school level because there was a, a school that was very, very sporting. Uh, and the one we were in weren't. And it was all just about taking part. And my mum was like, no, my sons need to be, and my daughter needs to be in a an environment where they want to be competitive. And, and that's where we went. So we went to a place called St. John's Primary School. And they, their head teacher. Oh, what a guy. I was actually talking to him about him not so long ago, and he was the one who really imprinted that competitive side of me. So a bit tough love. Nowadays, I don't think he would get away with the things he, he used to do back then. But, for instance, he'd take us out of 
like maths, English and stuff and takes down to the sports centre for swimming lessons if because we're in nationals and we're at Ponds Forge competing against all the schools in, in the UK and stuff. So he was a guy who taught me how to swim. And if we got anywhere close to the edge or we were starting to panic, he pushes back out into the water with a, a broom. He used to have a broom. Used bad, to, isn't it? Yeah, and that was our school teacher. I was our head teacher. Gymnastics, he actually broke my toe because I was trying to go over the vault. He was getting annoyed at the fact that my, my, my legs weren't straight enough and I wasn't where I should have been. And he, he pulled me and I, I broke my toe on the, on, the, on the way over. He used to, when we were doing splits, he used to push down on my shoulders. You know, nowadays, you can't even, you're not even allowed to do anything like that. But... Back then, it was acceptable. And it, at football, he used to let us go out again in the afternoons, practice, 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 because we had, like, championships coming up and stuff. So In a, in a world now where we exist, where you get in a 10th <laughs> place trophy, I just think that the the way that we were brought up in the 80s and 90s, yeah. we, it's, it's when I think back to some of the stuff that I was doing at school and some of the ways that teachers were operating with me yeah. and how that's helped me drive me in terms of today yeah in terms of like you know there's that, always that like you just said there's always that one teacher that, that kind of yeah. just gets you and just knows how to push buttons in you to motivate you to 100%. move more yeah do you think then that if that hadn't if you hadn't have had that like that then you wouldn't be as driven and, and wouldn't have achieved what you've achieved today 100 percent. i think that's what i was instilled i was what seven eight something like that being told that's how you should function and that's how you need to address certain things in your life that was definitely um, has helped me and uh, even at home my mum she was um she was quite a, a tough tough mother she was we, we were all out to work at 14 we were, I was pot washing every night from the age of 14 all my wages um from the end of the week were, were given to my mum as board and stuff so we were we learned how to um, fend for ourselves quite early we had chores <laughs> Every weekend, we had to do all the chores, like washing the windows, doing the ironing, doing everything you could imagine, washing the cars, um, your car. Uh, um, and yeah, like by the age of 16, I had three jobs. I was uh, wa- pot washing at night. I used to do uh, removals on a Saturday, uh, furniture removals. And then I was a plumber, apprentice plumber, and that's when I got into to plumbing. So yeah, I think a lot of people, a lot of like my friends around me, uh, a lot of their um, parents who used to see the way I was brought up, Used to, I'd say, frown upon it. Never used to say it to my face, but they could see it was a little bit too much. But at the same time, I appreciate money now. I appreciate hard work, and I appreciate that competitive side, which does push you you forward in life. Yeah, I think so, and 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 I think that's the, it's the upbringing that's 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 kept you the humble and everything you've achieved. Yeah. It, it keeps you grounded, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think so. I, I think that's important to have that that network around you, whether it's family, friends people you associate with that's so important to not lose yourself especially in this world because it, it has become I won't say like vanity stricken but with social media it, it, there's a certain way you have to be now and stuff and you can lose yourself in it and luckily I've got a team who would slap me back down if I ever did that yeah I, 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 it's, it's, so, it's so important you've, just, you've said that because obviously when you when you're not a bodybuilder and you're looking at bodybuilders and you could you could kind of make the judgment yeah. that are oh, these people are like vanity yeah. that they were bullied at school so they had to build a bigger body to kind yeah. of like you make all these assumptions yeah, that are just generalizations yeah. until you meet someone do you Definitely. know what I mean and I just think that it's the most misunderstood 100% because I think there are some beautiful characters in the sport from yeah. what I know but I think there there are also some narcissists <laughs> we get that in any yeah. any uh, yeah, any industry. But for instance, like I, I've always trained with super heavyweight bodybuilders. So yeah. class one bodybuilders, open class bodybuilders. So they're six foot odd, 300 pounds or 350 pounds, like serious, serious units. And they're scary. You know, when you look at, you go into a gym, back street, spit and sawdust, old gym, what I've, I've always trained in. It is a scary place for the first time you go in and you, you automatically think, he's an horrible bastard <laughs> because of the size <laughs> of him. But it, they're, they're the most genuine, biggest teddy bears you'll ever meet or... The, the experiences I've ever had anyway. Yeah. And they're the people who have guided me to where I'm at now as well. So, yeah, I'm massively appreciative of the sport, definitely. Do you think it's the same narrative that drives most bodybuilders? They come from, they might have been, they might have been that bullied child. They might have, you know, not felt like they were overlooked. They might have, you know, had a bit of a harder life. So they, so they've put their heart and their soul into, into crafting this, 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 um, not not so much this outer shell, but more this like a you know this it, they, they refining their yeah. physique. You know what I'm saying? A hundred percent. 
I've got to admit, most people I've met in the industry, there's always a backstory to it. There's always either a self-confidence issue. That's how I started. That's why I started about self-confidence. Or there is, like, say, being bullied at school or they've had a traumatic time. And building this physique and getting this confidence, and it all comes down to confidence, is is why they got into it, definitely. Yeah. So, Male and female as well. Yeah, I, 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 from what I've... From the people I've spoken to, I've always kind of think that. But what was it... What? Why was your why was your self confidence knocked? So I think for me, I was always I was a very active kid. Like I say, I was always doing every sport what was going on. I was allowed to do, um, but I was a greedy kid. There was three of us at home, and we were always getting back from school, fighting for the best foods they had in the cupboards and stuff. So I did start to to put weight on, um, and I didn't really notice it because my sports wasn't affected. And I was just going through that 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 stage. And when I hit fourteen. Obviously, secondary school hits. You start to think about girls, the way you look, and you've been a bit more self-conscious. And I just, yeah, I hit this all-time low where I just thought I needed to change myself. And I was really struggling with confidence. I could be very personable with people. I could be very friendly with people. I could be in any situation. I'll be fine. But there was always something inside me where I just never had that confidence. And I don't know why. I can't really pinpoint it because it's something I don't really talk about. But my brother and my sister both have the same thing. But yet... I look at my upbringing. I didn't really know my dad growing up. Um, I've only yeah, met him later down the line. But with my mum, yeah, although she was tough, we never went without. We never had the best things in life, but we never went without. If we needed a pair of football boots, we'd have them. Um, so they just wouldn't be the best football boots, but they'll do. Do you know what I mean? They'll do the job. So I could never really pinpoint why I felt like that. Um, again, I had a good... I was very sociable with, with children at that age of 14, no teenage and stuff, but it really hit me when I was 14 and I felt like I needed to do something about it. And when I look back at like my nutrition, it's absolutely crazy what I used to do, but in my head I thought that was the right thing to do. Where uh, I'd have my breakfast, not eat all day, not eat at school, not let anybody see me at school. Um, summer, I'd wear a T-shirt with uh, under my shirt and a jumper on and stuff just to cover my shape, but which you look back, it's stupid because it makes you look, twice as big <laughs> twice as uh, as fat as you thought you were in your head so don't know where it came from but I needed to do something about it um, and that's when yeah my, at the time my stepdad so to speak was uh, a super heavyweight British uh, champion in bodybuilding owned a backstreet bodybuilding gym and introduced me to that so he like literally took you under his wing and could see yeah. could see something within you like to give you an outlet yeah definitely and to be honest he was phew, he was the most yeah, some people think it was too hardcore to go into that, but he literally used to beast you in the gym. He wouldn't, he'd have a, a two-litre bottle, something like that, and if you ever welched out or you felt you had more or if you were stopping, if you were rest-pausing, they were around your knees and stuff like that. So he was, yeah, he, but I love that. that. That's what, again, for me, was, was really, I wanted to impress him, I wanted to impress myself, I wanted to push myself, and I saw early on my physique starting to change, and my abs were starting to come through, I was losing body fat, Sculpted my and physique. What, what age was this kind of when you started to see those changes? Probably around 15, 16. So the first year, no one took me seriously in the gym. I went in and I was just this little kid in the background or whatever. But I was always intrigued and I was always inspired. I never wanted to look like an open class bodybuilder, but this gym was f- full of them. Um, so I never really wanted to, yeah, I was never inspired to look like them or aspire to look like them. But I was always inspired by the way they trained and their motivation and how hard they pushed their bodies. And that was what I wanted to do. So I knew it was going to take time. I used to read all the muscle and fitness magazines back then at those, those times, flex magazines. And I knew it was a, a lifestyle. It wasn't going to happen in a month or so. And, and I just accepted that, put the work in. I used to finish school at like ten past, uh, half past three, catch the train because I used to live in a different town. So I'd catch the train to the next town get into the town centre for, um, yeah, four o'clock, do my session uh, till like half five-ish, and then I'd start my, my pot washing at six till ten at night. So it was regimented, and that, that's what probably instilled my how regimented I am in my food and training now. Yeah, because obviously, we, but even before <coughs> this podcast, it's like you needed to eat. Yes. And and, and you, you got to eat at certain times to, to make sure your body's got the right nutrition to be able to hit these yeah. these big workouts that you're doing to make yeah. sure that the nutrients is in your muscle at the right yeah. time. It's Apologies for being late, by the way. No, nah, I mean, yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> I had it's to all eat. good. I had to eat. Yeah. But yeah, but like, for instance, today, um, before nine o'clock, I had two big meals um, because my metabolism is so fast and I'm not naturally meant to hold this much muscle. So I, I have to get up earlier to get more meals in in the day. So how many meals are you eating at the moment? Between six and seven, uh, but they're big portions. 
big big portion so what would what would the calorie intake be on on your daily at the moment be a, between four and a half to five thousand uh, calories but that's all clean food as well and it's a lot of it's carbohydrates so it's harder to eat it as clean food though uh, people think yeah five thousand you can do that quite easily and you can two mcdonald's and you, you're nearly up there but trying to eat it with complex carbs essential fats and like organic bioavailable proteins is quite hard what's your food <laughs> bill at the end of the week I'm quite fortunate because I've got sponsors. So I've got Muscle Food who sponsor my uh, meat. Yeah. Because if not, that would be extortion. But it's, it's still over, it's still in the hundreds. Um, but if you took out all the sponsorship, what would it cost? Because obviously you didn't have a sponsorship initially, did you? No. Uh, yes, but I couldn't afford what I eat now. So I'm very fortunate. I have two fillet steaks a day. I have uh, two salmon fillets a day. I have three chicken breasts. I have, yeah, four eggs, oats, all them with white rice. So there's a lot of... Whereas back in the day, I'd have cans of tuna or mince meat, and so a lot cheaper options. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's but it's but it's, but but it's those but it's those things when you don't have everything, and when you have to make do. Yeah. It's like this podcast, mate. You know how passionate I am about it. Yeah. It's probably part of the reason why you come on it because you can see it, right? Yeah. Well, I don't have a fucking sponsor, so I'm spending all my own cash on producing yeah. the content and and all this that and the other, and sometimes you can think to yourself you can kind of get a little bit like wow man like i'm putting all this effort in like when's when's um when's someone going to see yeah. this do you know what i mean that, i was in that same position i was in that same position sorry to interrupt but that was exactly the same as me in 2000 what was it uh probably around 2012 2010 2012 yeah so a long time ago but at the time I remember I was doing all I wanted because before Men's Physique came out, so yeah, it was 2012 around that time. All I wanted to do was be a front cover model for for Muscle and Fitness, Men's yeah. Health, all that kind of stuff, because it wasn't classic or Men's Physique at the time. So I needed a goal. I've always needed a goal in life to work towards it. That's how I function. So my goal was to do that, but at the time I didn't have any sponsors. I didn't have anything, so I was still plumbing. But I needed to make it work, and I basically struck up a deal with the. Um, the owners or, or the um, producers of Muscle Fitness UK, and I said, when the next front cover comes up, can I be uh, in line for that? And if I can, I'll do all these free articles for you and do these photo shoots you need um, for you. So he went, I can't promise when that's going to be there, right? Because we use a lot of American models, and most of the models, uh, most of the front covers are set for the year. So I was like, right, okay, but I thought I'm going to do it because I need to do it, and this is you believe in something you work hard enough for it and you think yeah. right i'm going to focus on this it's going to happen so it did become six months later i'm still doing these articles taking a lot of my time up and i'm traveling up and down the country um doing these free photo shoots and even he said i said do you want some some money for this i was like no no please just stick to our deal even though i was desperate for it because i was on a, a apprenticeship wage and it came i got the phone call and they said the guys pulled out of, of the shoot for the november edition do you want to do it? Are you ready for it? And that changed my life massively because the moment I got that, I became a front cover model, which which brought me more value to, to my sponsors at the time. So then my wages went up because uh, I was on a, like, a, if I did a promo for a supplement company, I'd get paid for that day. Whereas I, I got a salary then and I could start to ease back off. I could quit my pot washing and still did my plumbing, but I quit, quit my pot washing. And I always had that in me, you know, like where I was yeah, thinking, right, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just moving on a, on a chessboard, isn't it? Just moving pieces, and that's what I was doing. And so I know where it is hard. In, it, in the early, it, it, and people don't see that as yeah. well with me. And it, it can, it can, um, mate. I, I've, I've had tears in my eyes over doing this. Yeah, I'll be serious with you because, and I don't know if you've had the same thing, but like, when you think about how much you put in something, yeah, when you love it, is, is, is it? It, it come. It, you can sit there one day and just and feel like it's, it's not quite happening for yeah. you oh, massively. and it can bring yeah. bring a, a, a massive emotional reaction out of you of course it can and I don't well, that's know that's because you're passionate about yeah. something isn't it? like even just talking about it now yeah, I'm I fucking I, yeah, yeah. do you know what I'm saying yeah, like, I, it's, it's like it's hard but what you were saying before we started this about making moves and you're going to make this happen you believe you're going to do it and you're two years down the line now and look how successful it is already so imagine the next two years and yeah. the next two years on from that and that's how you need to well, see it what you don't realise I'm going to tell you now yeah. So the, f- the, f- the third episode of this podcast is when I've had my first guest. That okay. guest was called, his called name was George Montagne, right? Montagne. He's, he's now just, he's an IF, um, he, he's an IFBB junior. Okay. He just won the IFBB juniors in Australia, right? Okay. 
he just he just placed first. You are someone that he, he and my friend, my other young lad, who's also into bodybuilding in Australia, yeah. Yeah. mate, Joe, is, is, is you're, you're, you're someone that they look up to. And they introduced me to you, right? Like okay. in terms of like they introduced me to who you were and all this stuff. Yeah. So, I, so I'm like, after I'd followed you for a while, I thought, I'm going to get you on the podcast. Now, I didn't know my mate Johnny yeah. knew you down the, <laughs> this all came to yeah, me yeah, down yeah. the track, right? But when I was when I was when I was doing that first guest podcast with him, and yeah. we recorded it, one mic sat at the table, this that, and the other. Yeah. We went on the balcony and we were looking out at the view, and I was like, "Oh, you know, you know, you're you're you know that guy that you like, Ryan Terry. I'm going to get him on the podcast. In he's, <laughs> he's going to be on the podcast." And now this is happening. Amazing. And it's, it, and it's just it's just it's just mad to yeah. me. Just sat here now thinking about that and how yeah, that's it. come about. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But do you think do you believe a lot in like the law of attraction and things yeah, like that, mate? Hundred percent, mate. Because yeah, that's exactly the same for me. You know, if you focus on something enough and you want it enough, you'll make it happen. Definitely, because what are the odds of that? You're sat in Australia well, two I, years ago. I don't know what it was. I, I wrote a list of the top 50 people that I wanted on. I bet be on that you, top spot. No, no, no. I'm serious. I'm serious. You're on that I'll list. Top five. I've got that list. It's in Australia. I'll send you a picture of it. Um, it's in it's 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 in my um, cupboard, and I've got vision boards and everything, mate. And and it's all it's everything everything that's that's come true so far. I've visioned it, but I only realised recently, and I was saying this to Joseph Valente. The other day, yesterday on the podcast, which is an episode probably before yours, but I was saying like it's all right visioning and all this stuff. I don't know about how you feel about this, but but what the piece that most people miss is the feeling. Yeah, it's feeling it now. How how have you used law of attraction in in what you've done? So if you look back on YouTube in 2013, I actually said something uh, on the Arnold Cla- uh, the British. I won the British finals. I'm doing an interview after, and I basically pulled up about what I envisaged for that. It wasn't even necessary in that year, but I, I did a, a vision board at the start of the year and I, and I had specific goals and they were very specific to me in that. Whether or not it's because I focused on those five and I just went for them no matter what or yeah. subconsciously the law of attraction was happening. But I wanted to be the first British pro in men's physique. I wanted to be the first Arnold Classic champion. I wanted an, an avenue into America because my dream was always to live in America, to, to be successful in America because we all on the outside, think America's the hub of sports and everything. So yeah, wanted to be there financially more, more dependent, more okay on my, my own, more financially available and be the first European to the Olympia. They're the only five points, something like that. Yeah, they're the only five points that I really knuckled down on and they were achieved in that year. And I completely forgot about it until my videographer after the show said, what about your vision? What about your vision board? Let's let's look back and see what you've achieved. And I'd achieved every single one of them because by winning the Arnold Classic, I got my pro card, which then said I could compete in America, which which gave me an avenue to be able to say I'm, I'm allowed to go to America now to compete over there. Um, financially, when I won the Arnold Classic, uh, won the British, all my sponsors gave me big pay rises so I could quit plumbing, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. it literally happened how I wanted it to happen and how I envisaged, envisaged it. It's amazing, bro. Because when you say that, it makes makes my, my like, they, like you know stand up. Look, yeah, yours, yours is that. Yeah, I know. When you talk always, about honestly, it, honestly, yeah, because because uh, you feel it. Yeah, it's like you feel it when you when you speak it. You feel it, and when yeah. um, when I speak it, I, I believe that people feel. Yeah, feel what I'm what yeah, I'm definitely. driving driven about. But the thing that that kind of that kind of real sticks out there for me, which I learned um, not only just from you saying it, but and reminding me, but. You said you did your vision board and you obviously visioned it and you felt it, but then you put it away and you yeah. forgot about it. Yeah. And that's that's another piece that most people forget. They say that you should you should you should vision it and feel into it and all that stuff, but then but then kind of forget about it and let yeah. the law work for itself. Yeah. Rather than just keep just yeah. keep trying to so restart what, it. So what I did, um I had um my wardrobe and I had a shelf inside my wardrobe where I used to have to take all my multivitamins, my omega-3s, all that kind of stuff. So I had my tablet box at the top of the shelf. So every time I used to open it, I stuck it to the, the front of the shelf to start with. So every time I opened it every morning, I just reiterated in my head the five points I wanted to achieve that year. And then when it got to a point where I was, I was thinking about it anyway, in the back of my head, I was already putting those into place. I took it down because I, I knew everything was working the way I wanted it to. So, yeah, uh, I, I, that is so 
so powerful, man. Yeah, definitely. Be- because, because if you keep, from what I've read and from people that have told me that have done this at, at various levels and kept manifesting stuff into their life, so to speak, yeah. and kept using this law, they say to me, once you've asked and once you've put it out there, that that's what you want. You don't need to keep yeah. keep. Every time you look at it and restart the pro- you restart in the process. Yeah. Just let that come to you now. Be- yeah, it will look at it will look after you. You know what I mean? It's, there's, it's- there's a few things though. Even for instance, this is another thing. So not a lot of people know now because it's like twelve, thirteen years ago. But what initially started for me, I won Mister Great Britain and Mister International. Um, that's what started my career. That's where I got my first sponsorship from, and that was in a beauty pageant. But that all came about because I'd slip discs in my back. I was a plumber at the time. Slipped discs in my back and I was bed bound and I was in a right mess. Um, I had to go back home because I couldn't function on my on my own. And um, I had a laptop and for some reason a pop up came up and there was this guy and he was in a full suit and he had a sash on, sat like a on his throne, so to speak. And his name was Bruno Kettles and he was from Bolivia and he was the current Mister International. And they were advertising uh, auditions for Mister Great Britain to to go and challenge uh, to take this title because you can only win it once. And I was looking at it, and I don't know why, because I was a plumber, never took a photo in my life, I was the shyest guy in the room to take pictures and stuff, but there was something saying, do it, just do it, and I was thinking, well, where do you start with that, and it's a little advert, it could have been a, a con, it could have been anything, but I did it, I took the leap of faith and I went with it, ended up in London in uh, Pineapple Studios a few weeks later, uh, when we back was a lot better as well, um, and we started doing these competitions, and I was against, I don't know, three, four hundred different um, people fighting for this Mr. Great Britain title. Didn't have a clue where it was going, what it was, whether it was legit or not. Uh, but I just went with it. Something was telling me to go with it. And I said, I actually said it to me, well, I want to be that guy because he looks so smart. And I'm, I'm working on site, scruffy all the time, never, always in school, never did my hair. He was really smart in his suit. And it looked like he lived this amazing article about where he's come from, what he does now. Um, so I was like, I want to be him. I want to do that. And, um, yeah, I won Mr. Great Britain. And then, about two months after that, I'm on a plane to Indonesia, competing against 42 different pe- uh, different countries, all like Calvin Klein models, all proper catwalk model guys, and I'm fighting for three weeks. We had um, a week in Bali, a week in, Indone- uh, in Jakarta, and a week in Bandung, so we were, we were in the rainforest fighting each other, and it was absolutely amazing, doing these different uh, challenges, competitions and stuff, um, on the beach, having to cook seafood and, and fish and stuff, it was just... An amazing experience, absolutely. And I ended up winning uh, in front of 200 odd million people, which was a, a live on, on TV with massive production. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. I just making it up as I go along. If you type on YouTube, Mr. International Ryan Terry, you'll see it all. I look very young there. But um, yeah, I won Best Body Award and I won Mr. International, his title. And it was just crazy to think I was crying in my bed, feeling very sorry for myself, not knowing what I was going to do, like absolutely in bits, thinking I was going to get sacked from a job lose my house because I couldn't pay the, the mortgage. And I just saw this little thing and it just told me to do it. And the next minute, I'm, yeah. Do you, be, do you believe then in, there's there's an inner wisdom within ourselves that we kind of have to, uh, uh, it's in those so- moments of solitude when you're alone and you're silent mm. that, that those come to you? Possibly, yeah. I, d- I don't know. It, for me, it was just, I don't know how deep you want to go with it. I've never really delved into that and really thought about that too much, but it was just something telling me. And I remember being in bed and I, so I got the laptop out and I saw it and I was just at the lowest part of, of my life at that time because I'd never really experienced any other uh, harsh lives or whatever, uh, life experiences. And that was a really low time for me because I was in so much pain every day. Didn't know whether I was going to be able to like properly walk again. Like, and it sounds dramatic, but without being in pain, uh, I could walk. But obviously, I was always in pain. And then, yeah, just and then everything went as well. I didn't have the operation because I was meant to have a, a fused disc. Didn't have that done because I went to Mr. International. And then, yeah, the rest is history, really. I, th- I think I think J- Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about this. I don't know if you know Dr. Joe Dispenza, no. but he he talks about. Um, the power of the mind and how the mind can heal the body, mm. and it's like it just seems to me like when you took when you took your mind mm. to a more positive place 100%. and had a different focus, yeah. everything that every, all the physical ailments in your body that kind of needed to fuck off fucked off because yeah. you weren't putting no time and attention there. Like if you think about pain all the time, yeah. you, you you attract Focusing more. You attract yeah. you attract you attract what you focus on. You but it's hard though because life isn't all like sunshine and rainbows exactly so you do have those negative parts and once you've 
got that in you, it's very hard to swap uh, to to swap that up for positive thoughts. But yeah, I definitely think that because I, I remember 2016. I was uh, going to the Arnold Classic. I was a few weeks out, and I just was in a bad place. You know, like every prep I've ever had, I've always been mentally sound with it. I've always been okay. You know, going for it. But there was just this one time I was just just not feeling it, just really like, and it was in my head all the time. And because I was trying to focus on the law of attraction, I was like, no, no, get these negative thoughts out because what you're thinking, you're attracting. And I started to overthink the process and I was thinking negative thoughts so much. I um, I got a parasite two weeks before um, and three bacteria, amoeba. And uh, yeah, just the only prep I've done where it just ruined, um, I, I couldn't even stand up on stage and I was in a mess and I just thought, I've attracted that because I was literally focused on it. Any other time I've done it, I've been absolutely fine, but the one time I was in my head being negative, and yeah. How do you, how do you though, in in from your experience, how do you manage to let those thoughts go? From like, what's what's the best what's the best way you have found? Is it just concentrating on fully being present in the moment that you're in? Yeah. Or yeah, definitely, I, I think that as well, and I think. As I've got older, obviously my priorities have changed now and obviously I've got a family to provide for and stuff and that's always been quite a motivating factor for me but I've always wanted to be the best at what what I'm doing at the time. Um, so f- for me, I haven't achieved what I want to achieve in the sport yet which is being Mr Olympia. So that is enough for me to, like say, get in my zone, focus on my next session, focus on my next meal and take take the thought process out of it. You just get the work done. You know what you have to do now. You know you have to get your six meals in. You know you have to sleep at a certain amount of time and you need to put the effort in. And, and that's all I do now. I kind of just switch off from it. When you get, when you do, when you get to that, when you're, when you're stood on that and you're being presented with that, Mr. Olympia, you're champion now. When that inevitably happens and that is your reality, mm. what is kind of, what is beyond that for you? <laughs> that So, yeah, so that is quite a difficult question because... I'll openly admit this and say I am scared of that I at, at that point in my life because, I, like I said to you previously, I've always had a goal to work towards. I've always had something that motivates me to get there. And, and compete has always been a great factor for me because whenever I'm in prep and I'm low on food and all that kind of stuff, I function better. My work um, is better. I'm, I'm more organised through the day and stuff. And chasing that high is everything I've worked for for the last 20 years in, in sports and in my career and stuff. So, and when you achieve it, obviously after any high, you always come back down and then you think, right, the next one you've got to get a bit bigger. And that's what I've done my whole career. So every show I've done, I've always tried to pick something what either someone's not achieved yet, so you're the first person to do it, or it's a show of more value, it's a bigger, it's more prestigious show. And that's how I've worked my way up. I never just went, right, I want that and then the Olympia. I want that show, which was like, a U- uh, it was a, a pro show. Then I wanted to win the Pittsburgh Pro because it's a slightly more prestigious show. Then I wanted to win the Arnold Classics, as many as I could around the world, and then obviously the Olympia. And that's how I've always worked. So after that, it does scare me because if when I stop competing, even when I stop competing, I need something. And most most competitors do in any sport need something to to shift their focus on because when you've put your heart and soul into something and then. You've achieved it. It's very yeah. hard. Uh, where do you go from there? Um, I, that, that's I, the unknown for me at the minute. Yeah, I've had. I've. I, I, at different points in my life, I've had pinnacle events that I want to achieve. Yeah. and had nothing beyond it. Yeah, and when I've got to those pinnacle events and I've achieved that, I'm like, wow. Yeah, what next? I'm, I'm like, uh, th- that wasn't everything that I built it up to be. Oh, okay. Sometimes, it, yeah, and sometimes I'd pursued them for all the wrong reasons yeah. for you I know that it's a purpose driven reason and, you're, yeah. and your purpose is in it but it's, I'm, I get I get um, I, I often ask athletes this like what's after that because yeah. not a lot of them have any idea yeah. and that can lead to real yeah, off oh, a cliff yeah. off a cliff moment I've met so many people in my life who are exactly that a lot of ex pro body but uh, pro rugby players uh, and a lot of them now are in sports supplements which is funny when you talk to like sales reps and stuff a lot of them have come from a pro background but they've all I spoke spoke to their wives I've got to know them quite well and stuff and they all said those are the lowest parts of their careers is when they've, they've retired at such a high level they were an important person in their team or themselves to then have nothing have no goal or have no purpose is a real struggle and that's always worried me and, and that happened to me when was it I was, I was in France was meeting an ex-rugby player there and we were chatting away and that's what made me think, right, I need to start 
although I love bodybuilding, I love competing and, and it's my life, I need to look at different avenues where I can, what's the word, where I can, um, yeah, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but to fulfill what I need to do other than competing. So for me, I, um, I've set up four or five businesses now in the background. So since that day, I've, I've been working to set them up because that's what will stimulate. That's what I was trying to say, to like stimulate that. Yeah, stimulate that. your growth. Yeah. yeah. And, and I can push and focus on something more. I focus, My family are a huge focus for me. and they're, they're the forefront of anything now, but I'm the provider of my, my family. And I want my son uh, and my wife to, to have a life. I'm not saying that I didn't have because I didn't have an unprivileged life or anything, but... I just want to be able to give them what the, what they deserve or what they want. Is that time when you when you when your son was born? Is it was that the first time that you saw unconditional love? Oh yeah. Um, no, like I said, I, I've got like I've got brilliant siblings around me who who are very loving and whatnot. I've never not felt loved or anything. But when when you become a parent, and and, and everyone says it as well, when when you become a parent, things change for you. And I just didn't realize how much it does. Like that person literally in the split second once he's here changed everything for me like I wasn't as important in my life anymore now I'm fine with that I wasn't the main priority anymore and I'm not the main priority he is like everything he needs is at the top of my list and he will always come first whereas bodybuilding is not like that bodybuilding is, is quite a selfish sport you have to be not in a nasty way but it has to be because everything has to come first you're eating you're sleeping you're training that all comes first over any social life any relationship um so when he came on board i was like being a dad is my number one priority no matter what and giving him everything he needs even if it costs you at certain points the opportunity to yeah. not even a doubt people always say like would you rather have the libertad <laughs> not in a million years i i that has been my my live stream is being mr olympia but can't explain it cannot explain it he just changes everything overnight. But the thing is that then there's a flip to it because people might be listening to this thinking, well, he's lost his fire and he's lost his drive. He's not, it's not his main focus anymore. But that's not the case. It just gives you a different perspective. Like now, one, I have to be more regimented because he, ha- I have to fit into his life or he fits into my life. But my bodybuilding comes after him. But I get everything done. There's no excuses. If you want something bad enough, you'll go and do it. Yeah. But it gives you another perspective like, this is what I'm working for. If I'm Mr. Olympia, how proud would my son be in the audience watching his dad win? And th- that was what drove me for the Arnold Classic in the UK uh, last October. Uh, Amy said it, uh, like my wife said, we got him front row. He actually had the best seat in the house, my son. He was one years old, not a clue what's going off. And he had 1A, the seat was, and he was behind the head judge, front row. It was a phenomenal seat. And he, he only lasted about five minutes because it was carnage absolute carnage there there's thousands of people there and it was too much for him so we took him out of it but that for me knowing he was going to be there well oh, that was just unbelievable um injuries went like focus was just a hundred percent getting up in the middle of the night feeding him and then getting up at five doing my training so because you've met because you've made bodybuilding about something way bigger than yourself yeah definitely. and i think that's what's added it add the way that you've the way that your son motivates you adds an extra layer to you, doesn't 100%. take away. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so the Arnold Classic, the last Arnold Classic, that was the best I ever looked, the biggest I ever looked, the best I ever felt. The, the the prep went perfectly well where I had no injuries, all that kind of stuff. And I do believe it was because it was my first proper prep with with him. And if we talk about the negative side of it, obviously my last Olympia showing was, was my worst showing. And it's because I didn't want to be there. My son had just been born. Uh, we had to go, obviously... Mid, mid-pandemic, had to go and isolate in Dubai for, for 12 weeks, I think it was, um, and then go on to America for two weeks. And I was just away from him. And, and the whole time, I was just missing him, thinking, you should be there with, with your son. Like he's, uh, so he you kind of felt guilty. Oh, it's horrendous. And instead of thinking, right, you're 14 days out from the Olympia, I was thinking, I'm 15 days out from being back with my son. And going up against the best people in the world who are hungry for it, who, who are living for it, you can't have that that mindset. You you just can't, um, and it showed. Like I was just, I wasn't even bothered about my place. And all I wanted to do was get off stage and get on that flight the next the next day. So, it, yeah, that's when I realised I needed to take a step back. And it, all it was is just I'd, I'd not got into my routine. I'd not I'd not given enough time to becoming a dad and a bodybuilder at the same time. I was like trying to to do both, but I was doing them both poorly. Um, and that that it showed. I wasn't there for him, and I was at the um, the Olympia showing my bad placing. So I just, yeah, we reset. I said I had a year out from the Olympia, which I did last year. I did the Arnold because it was in the UK. Amy was fully backing me. 
Um, we were in a really good routine with Alfie, made sure they were happy with it. It was a family decision. It wasn't my decision to make. It was a family decision. And yeah, we went for it. And yeah. is, is, is your relationship with Alfie something that you're not only deeply passionate about because obviously you're his dad, which is inevitable, but is it, is there something in that because of your lack of relationship with your dad when you were a child? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I can say, I don't want to speak ill of my dad because he's in, he's in my life now and stuff. And we don't have a, a really, a, a really close relationship or anything like that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot closer to my mum, but yeah, I, I definitely think that's an element of factor. Like I don't want to miss a day without Alfie. And that even like say going away, even though it was to provide for him and I am the breadwinner and, and stuff in our family. So, Going away was a necessity because my sponsors require it and, and all that kind of stuff. So I know I, ha- I had to go, but at the same time, like, I, yeah, I don't want to miss anything. I don't want to miss him growing up and stuff because I didn't see my dad for, yeah, about 12, 13 years. A big, a big, and he was in the same town as me. Um, and we share the same birthday at uh, the same day. So, yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was a bit of a sad time. It shouldn't have happened. But I think that definitely instilled into me that I'm not missing anything of my son growing up to give yourself peace with that in terms of like your dad and obviously to bring him back into your life did you yeah. ever kind of think into like how he must have been feeling in terms of like you know what was his motives for what happened because a lot of the a lot of the times especially with things that have happened with parents my parents and stuff like that and, and my relationship with them at certain points in life yeah sometimes you have to step back and think oh how are they feeling at that point in life and what are they yeah. going through yeah, yeah, I, I do. Um, but obviously, I was young. I was I was quite a young young child back then, so I didn't really understand it. I just went off what my mum used to say, and and that's one thing. She's she's apologised as I've grown up. You make mistakes in life, don't you? So if, if because she had this this bad blood towards my dad, um, she that's how she portrayed him to us. Yeah, he's not a bad man. He he's he's a very he's quite a selfish man, but he's just. In his way, he's just quite placid, very laid back, just does his own thing, kind of like that. He's, yeah, he's my dad and I love him very much. But at the time, he was this monster because of what had been told. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't think I about think, what he I, was thinking. I think there's a lot, I think a lot of people that maybe listen to this and, uh, and a lot of people in life are going through that where the mum or dad has portrayed the other one to be this yeah. big demon because they've never dealt with... They've never dealt with their issues themselves. Yeah, 100%. And it's, it's like, it's a pattern that has to be broken at some point. 100%. So this is what I said to Amy, um, my wife. I said, like, obviously, when Alfie was born, I said, no matter what, if for any reason we're not together, which, God forbid, God forbid we, we don't have a split up, but if for any reason, I said, please, please promise me, whoever it is that we, we don't show that to, the, to Alfie and that we... But again, <laughs> yeah, when people are scorned, then... Things change, it's, don't it's they? But an, I just, it's an emotion. It's an emotional. But it's good that you've had the conversation. I yeah. Mean, to kind of, to kind of. Well, you kids know. remember any age. Like Amy's told me stories where she remembers when she was five, like where her parents they should have split up because they were not in a good relationship at the time. So when they remember that, and the kids take that on board, and they're, they're like sponges, aren't they? They do remember a lot of things. Yes, he's he's only two now, but we are so conscious about if we even got a little niggle with each. We don't hardly ever argue, but if there's anything, we always take ourselves out of the situation from Alfie, or we do it when he's not there. Little things like that, and we we we're not perfect, but we try to do the best by Alfie and, and not see that. How important has it been having her in your life as a supportive background to obviously bodybuilding? Because I've obviously interviewed a lot of successful people. Um, and I'm I'm a single man myself, but when I look from the outside looking in, I look at I look at the common ground with a lot of successful people, like the Davy Fogarty's that own the Udi, yeah. or the or the boy or the, or the high smile boys, or other people that I've had on real big people, big entrepreneurs, uh, Paul Richards, and all that kind of stuff. They've yeah. all got a good woman behind them. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. So that is key. Having a good team around you and having that support network is is massive, really. Um, speak to Jay Cutler. I, I, used, I went to India with him doing a tour with him, and I remember him saying something. I said, "Why did you quit so soon?" Because yes, um, Ronnie was coming up. One of I said, "Why?" Uh, sorry, uh, Phil Phil Heath was coming up like chasing him. I said, "Why did you quit?" So, and it's because his marriage broke down. Uh, it, it, what that was the fundamentals of it. It was basically he lost that winning piece. Like his wife obviously used to cook his food, very supportive, do everything he needed to, yeah. to help him achieve. Obviously, he put the work in, but she was there to support yeah. him. And I think he he said, "I lost that winning formula. I lost the passion, and whatnot, when that went." And it's the same for me with Amy. Like when I was I was already competing and whatnot, but when I met Amy, she 
she wasn't into bodybuilding, never trained a day in life. She used to have a, when I met her, it was a, a pizza and Pringles every day. That was a, a daily intake. And I absolutely loved that because it kept me grounded because she wasn't in the world of, of bodybuilding. She wasn't counting macros and stuff. And it just, I don't know, it was a good balance for us. And and it always has been. And she's been so supportive, lets me go and do what I need to do. She knows that like, with Alfie, like the last prep, we were about four weeks out, three, three and a half, four weeks out. And I was really starting to struggle because I, like I said to you before, I'm really conscious of not being the best dad I can be. So it got to, got to a point where I was even struggling to pick him up at times or play with him because I was so tired, low in body fat, uh, low in calories, energy level, brain fog's happening. It, it always happens. In, if, you're, if you're in the really deep end of your prep, if you're not feeling those, then you're not, you're not deep enough in your prep. It, it's, it's very testing mentally that last four weeks. And I, but it was, I was baffing him. And I was just even leaning over the bath and I was really tired and I was thinking this is not good because I don't, want to be this for him I, I'm not in the room I'm not present yeah, with him. yeah 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 and and she saw that straight away and she just said Ryan it's four weeks and we sat I had a bit of a cry while we sat next to in the bath like whilst we're bathing him and she just said let me take him on let me have 70 80 percent of the of the workload you concentrate on body it's four weeks you, you concentrate and I'll I'll take your your I'll pick up the slack and she did and she was phenomenal she let me like say um she was changing him more in the day, you know, like just yeah. keeping him active and stuff. And I was, I was there, but I just I had to concentrate on bodybuilding. And again, best prep I ever did. Like the last four weeks um, was phenomenal. And then straight after, booked as a family holiday. It was all about the Alfie and, and my wife, and just showed them everything. I gave them all the attention what I couldn't give them in the four weeks before. So it's, be- it's beautiful that because the one word that kind of I now think is complete bullshit is the word self-made. Yeah, uh, because yeah. because I because I just when I look at ed, anybody who's had any success, yeah, even like the the limited success that I've had so far in my life, every part of it has had, you know, somebody's helped me. Yeah, you know, people have stepped on before before their time in, yeah. in the podcast. You know, people are giving me opportunities, and you yeah. know, it's even like this speaking event that I'm doing at IFS. It's like you know, that's an opportunity for me. Yeah, it's my first speaking event. It's like people give people give you opportunities, give you leg ups. It's like it's 100%. like no what no one is self made. Yeah, you know, for you to have that best prep that you've had and to stand yeah. there and feel as good as you felt. Yeah. Was because you, you know your your wife had, had said you know and given you yeah. that. And giving but she you that, saw yeah. it though because I actually turned around. And I said, I think I'm gonna knock this on the head. I think I'm I'm done. Um, and she was like, Why? Like you you're so close. And I said, Because I'm not I'm not a good husband because I, I'm, I'm not in the room. I'm not present with you. Whereas you was accepting of that before, but I don't want to be a bad dad. That's my main yeah. thing. I just I can't explain that that for me. So being tired, not being able to pick him up like all the time, and wanting to like run around the garden with him, it just yeah, it hit me really hard. I thought, nah, I'm done. This isn't part of where I'm at now in my in my life. I, the, um, but yeah, she understood. She took a step back. She supported me, and yeah, phenomenal, really. Mate, I I fully get that because I remember I just recorded an episode with um, with this one of the biggest DJs in Australian history called Will Sparks, right? Okay, and. Um, I was buzzing about this episode and I was dating this girl at the time and she came round and all I wanted her to do, she said, I can I listen to the episode. All I wanted her to do was just, was just, I was buzzing me. I was, I knew it was one of my best episodes at the time. At that time I was buzzing. I was just like the other and she listened to it and she just criticized and criticized and criticized and just put me down. And and I was sat there and I was like, fuck man. I I, 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 I was up here before you came. Yeah, like, I'm thinking to myself, do you know what? I went, I really wanted to fucking wife you up. Yeah. I really wanted to like, yeah. I really wanted to actually have a, a genuine relationship with you. Yeah. And all you've done is come around here after I've done that and fucking put me down. Yeah. So to know that you've got a jealous some, or a self-conscious, uh, something like that. But, but just hearing you tell that story and, and understanding how much that must have meant to you. Oh, massive. Massive, yeah. It's, it's it's so important that you just have those little pieces, and they seem like little pieces, but that the, the just facilitate you. Yeah, that's yeah, that's facilitate. It. That's that's yeah. that's the word I'm looking for. Like they facilitate your growth to allow that trajectory. Yeah, because and that's why, like I said to you before, it's like self-made is just such a bullshit word. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't exist. But they're always saying to me as well, like you can either be a great bodybuilder or a great dad. You can't be both. And again, I, that, I think that's why I was so conscious of, shit, I'm not a good dad now because I'm, I'm focused on my bodybuilding. Shit, I'm not a good bodybuilder because I'm focused on, on Alfie. But yet, 
Who that, says you can't have both? Exactly. And you, you can. Um, you, you definitely can. It's just, if you want it bad enough, it, is, it, it comes down to. But then you can, you can, a lot of these people that say you can't have both, they're probably trying to go out at night or trying to do other things at night, which is, yeah. you know, they're trying to put other things in to, to yeah. have, to, that's why they're taking themselves out of balance. But essentially what you're saying is, you can't bodybuild all day long, can you? Like, at yeah. the end of the day, you can only spend two hours in the exactly, gym a day yeah. working out. And yeah. if you hit your meals yeah. and you hit your sleep, exactly, that's going to be taken care of anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, it's like thinking it ahead. So, right, if you prep all your meals on a Sunday night for the next three days, you've got no excuse and you're not prepping every day. So, you're not having two or three hours out of your day to that two or three hours you're saving in cooking each day. You can spend time. Do with you still prep all your own meals? I do, yeah. It's, it's funny you should say that because I actually spoke about this was it yesterday or the day before where so I wouldn't like, have why, thought why? that I don't, yeah, don't get it but people say like why do you prep your own food because there's all these prep companies that always reach out and there's some amazing prep companies out there um, but last year something clicked with me where I won't say I had it too easy but it bodybuilding is such a I don't know how to explain it it's, you have to do everything they don't say that you don't have to do everything yourself but it got to a point where I had someone doing my caliper readings doing my weight every morning um my nutrition, like my training, it I had takes it all out the out. reps. It just took everything out of it, and then I had someone cooking, prepping my meals. And for me, I got lazy with it. Like when when you're having to work hard for it, when you're having to do everything yourself, I don't know. It just seemed to be you do it. And and for me, prepping my own meals, yes, it's monotonous. Yes, it's boring and takes a lot of time to do. But you know exactly what's gone into those meals and how much effort you've put into getting it all done and prepping. And for me, that's important, really important. So I chose to do it myself. I'm. You just saying that is I'm going to go back to doing it. Yeah. Because I've, when I used to prep all my own meals, and I'm talking a good few years ago, that's when my physique was at its best. Same. Like in terms of like, in terms of like, it, that was when it was easy, easiest for me to, to hit a certain weight, to hit yeah. a certain physique at certain times. Definitely. And since I've been using like prep, different prep companies or, you know, getting my mum to help me out while I'm in the UK or whatever, whatever or not prepping like that's when yeah you can't you can't control it yeah. to the nth degree yeah definitely and i just i don't know for me I, I wanted to make myself um i'm the only person who's accountable to myself so when i was prepping my last prep i decided which most bodybuilders said it's suicide to do but it was the best thing i ever did which was i won't say get rid of my team but go it alone go on my own because in the early days I used to prep myself, so used to I didn't used to weigh myself, didn't used to do my calibre. I couldn't afford to have my calibre readings done or DEXA scans done. Um, I couldn't afford to have a nutritionist, all that kind of stuff. I there was a guy in the gym who used to look over me and say, "You're only a bit back fat. You need to increase your cardio or drop your carbs." So that was the level of guidance I used to have back then. And I used to do everything myself on look in the mirror, how I used to pump up, how fatigued I was. If I was plateauing um, and I wasn't getting the pumps, then I'd refeed. And it was very basic um, bodybuilding, very basic way to look at it. But they were my best results and they were the, the way I looked the best, the, the most enjoyment when I used to train. I used to love the whole prep because of it. It was just, it wasn't about figures and numbers and, and, and graphs and Excel spreadsheets and stuff. It was just about how you felt and going balls to wall like when I train you'll always see that I'm, I'm very sporadic in my training I'm just how I feel on the day I just want to go in block the world out and just go as hard as I can for an hour until I've got nothing left once I've lost my pump and I'm starting to, to go past that so to speak going into a catabolic state I walk away I get out of there I don't think right I've got to have three sets of 12 on this exercise that works for some people but for me it never did um, and my last prep so three years before, two years before that, I went with a coach who's, who's the biggest, supposed to be the best coach in the world. He has amazing credentials, got the Olympia title, nine Olympia titles to his name and stuff. And I thought, is that the missing piece? Is that, is that what I need and stuff? So I moved to America. I was in his, um, I was in the same apartment blocks. So he was next door to me. And he literally, everything was weighing yourself every day. Every calorie you consumed, every tablet you consumed, everything was so methodical, but it was so over the top where it took the enjoyment out for me. I, I didn't know my own body anymore. I didn't, I started to not be confident in myself because I was just listening to everything he said. I didn't ask questions. I just did what he told me to. And it, it got to a point where I'm like, no, I need to do this for me. I need to go back to why I got into it, why I love bodybuilding. And it's me 
learning my metabolism every year. My, as I'm getting older, my, my metabolism changes and it, it becomes harder. So every prep you're having to learn yourself, whereas I wasn't doing that. So everyone was doing it for me. And I was like, no, I need yeah. this back. So the last Arnold prep, I decided to go it alone, do it all myself, uh, stop weighing myself, stop having my caliper readings done, no DEXA scans, um, no nutritionist, no trainer, nothing. Um, no prep coat, uh, as in meals, prepping like chefing or anything like that. I did it all myself. Yes, it was harder. Yes, there were times where I was like, I need someone to just feed off or whatever. But best ever felt. And I wanted to step on stage. If it was going to be my last time, which I was thinking about it was going to be, I wanted to know that I was accountable. I had no excuses. I can't blame that guy. I can't blame this person. You got my calibre readings wrong. I wanted to say, it's all on me. I've made the mistakes. Yeah, I love that. And, and yeah. That self accountability, I think, is really important. And just from you saying that, when I think about my training, yeah, and I've got into a bad habit now where I need a trainer on leg day, right? Because I don't want to, I can't motivate myself to go do it myself anymore. Yeah. And, and, and 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 um, and do you know what? I'm I'm going to take that out. I, I'm going I'm going I'm going to get rid of all trainers. And I'm going to go alone again because I think I need to to build up that feeling yeah. and, and what you just talked about I've just, it's just clicked with me in my head right yeah. this second that I've got to start taking ownership yeah. of of not of, of, of these areas because if I don't take ownership I can't empower myself And but don't you think that, that resonates with business as well so like if there's things where there's hurdles that come into place and you're wanting someone to fix them for me I'm like no I'll fix it I need to fix it I've, I've had a problem with uh, my clothing shorts so I brought out um, Alta which yeah. is a clothing company of mine and that's that's for my son. I've built that for my son. So Alta is Alfie Lewis Terry Aesthetics. And when he's 18, I, I want to hand it to him. If he wants it, that is. But hopefully it'll be a success then. But I had a huge problem uh, this past year. Put a massive order in. We, um, without going into it too much, but we did two years of, of sampling, getting the, the fit, getting everything right. Spent a lot of money getting it perfect. We, we, we released it last year, sold out instantly. So I knew there was a demand for it. I knew the quality yeah. was there. And I knew people appreciated what we'd done. So... Went in with a big order and we finally got it after the pandemic and sort of a lot, a lot of uh, hassle. But came back and um, the, the sizing was wrong. The sizing was just, the cut was wrong. They just got it. The quality was there. Everything was there, but the sizing was just slightly off. And I was like... And these are, uh, were these already items that you'd sold? No, these were items that I'd paid for up front because yeah. you, have to, you have to with with uh, Because there's minimum stuff. orders, yeah. Yeah. And they were in stock. They were telling us, like, the, the next lot won't, you're going to take a year to get the next lot. Um, they're perfectly adequate. They are industry standard, they kept telling me, industry standard. Um, and they're what you signed off. And they were a huge company, massive, massive company I'm going up against. And I was looking around thinking, I need help with this. And I was trying to, like, what, you know, go off because I could have released them. But, but, the, for but, me, but you, they wouldn't have sat well with you. No, 100%. Because it wasn't about the money, because I would have lost a lot of money if, if uh, I'd have lost this case. But, Going back to what we were saying is like I could have gone an easy way out and, and got people to fight it or do it. And I was like, no, I've got to do this because it's it's the company I've built from scratch and it's something that means a lot to me because it's associated to Alfie. So I spent hours and hours and hours going through reams of emails. Like you wouldn't believe reams of them. Um, over two years trying to prove that that's not why I passed off. We we didn't, this isn't industry standard. I didn't, got all the contracts up and, and whatnot and I could have just paid someone to do it but I needed to do it for myself and Luckily, uh, we w- I won it a couple of weeks ago, and we're in remanufacturing now. But with the same company, yeah, with the same company because yeah, they've admitted fault, and, and we're getting it sorted. But uh, yeah, that that was something like I could have ran away from, and I thought, no, I've got to do it myself. I've got to do this because if not, you're just going to make it too easy getting other people to do it. I'm like, I've got to do it myself. With <laughs> with um, Joe Foster taught me this from Reebok. He said that there's um, because I asked him about all this kind of you know. He, he told me there's a thing called a sealed sample. I don't right. know if they have this with making of tech shorts and all that stuff, but when you when he signs off on a shoe, yeah. when he signed off on a Reebok to be made from this factory over here, they would send him a sealed sample of how that's going to be. They'd seal it. They'd both sign off on the sealed sample, and they'd yeah. keep they'd keep one, one sealed each. sample each. And then when they got the order through, they'd compare the sealed sample c- yeah. to to, the, to this. And if it wasn't the same as what was agreed on, then yeah. there could be that that was how they operated. Yeah. I don't know. Is that similar? Yeah. No. Exactly the same. So there was a five point um, quality check and luckily obviously I had the original samples and, and they did as well um, it was just, it was difficult because how far out were these samples then? not a lot anybody else would have probably just released them I must admit they were 
they were about they were about point five centimeter on each on each seam, which doesn't sound like so you're half a centimetre, but overall, I'd worked two years and spent so much money having samples back and forth. I could have released them two years ago when I was, I was deeper into my, yeah. my career and competing and stuff and, and, and been a lot more successful, but there's more to it. Like Alta, I wanted to be the best board shot on, on the planet for competing, and obviously I've, I've competed for over 12 years, and I know what it takes like, like with, with and that half a centimetre is, 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 is a little bit less definition that so, you see in your leg yeah right? so for instance yeah I, I always wanted them to accentuate the physique so I always wanted them to hug the quad to, to sit around the teardrop um, yeah. there were certain things like that four way stretch material so it, it, the, the lines go with, um, vertical uh, sorry horizontal to, to give the illusion of, of a wider leg so you get that egg shape look there's so much gone into it and I just weren't willing to compromise because they didn't sit. They were they were baggy on on the, the teardrop because 0.5 added 0.5 because it was on every part. Yeah, which equated to about about three or four centimeters. So that is the difference between medium and large. And at, when at, you're at that level, and it's not only that, it's it's that far down. Yeah. What you're talking about is that far down yeah. the quad. And the, and the thing for me though as well. I, I appreciate because I've been on stage and I appreciate how m- much people put into their prep at any level, amateur to pro, whatever level, when you're putting 16 weeks of, of graft and hard work into a prep to then not be able to show the physique off the way you want because you've bought a 60, 70, 80 pound pair of shorts and they're not fitting the physique how they should. Yeah. I'd be devastated because you need to feel a million dollars on stage. That, that's how you need to, you need to be confident in every aspect of your physique and the shorts are a big aspect of our physique. It's it's like to a man. It's like even the boxes that you wear, yeah. like that, they, they make you feel a certain way before you put the top layer on. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like every, everything's about how it fits and yeah. how it feels. And of if you it is. and if you feel good and if it fits well and if you and if you feel um, like real good, then you're going to perform at yeah. a lot better level. Uh, yeah, and that, that's how I felt when I built Alta. Like I say. I get, I understand how much it goes into it. And people, it's, it's a quite an, an expensive sport when you, you think about the uh, the dieting, the food. Yeah. Um, even entering shows now, the tanning, all that kind of stuff, it's, it's expensive. And, and buying the shorts, like, because they are so hard to make, I now know why I've, there's not a lot of board short companies out there for men's physique. I think there's two in the world, which I'm shocked at because it's been around seven, eight years, this sport. But there's a reason for that. There is definitely a reason for it. Um, but I just, I was determined not to fail with it. I wanted to be yeah partly because of Alfie but but as well because it was something I I believe could be amazing and big out there do you have to patent the shape of the short once you've got it once you've got it no no, I don't think so no like the four way stretch material you you can get but it's just different types like with different elastanes in it and, and that's what was difficult because certain things were hugging in certain areas which you don't want and and vice versa so we finally got it and I just remember that feeling of putting them I was like this is it. These are the ones. And that's what I won the Arnold Classic in. It was, the again, the most confident I ever felt because if you look in other shows, all the shorts I've worn, I've always worn blue, but they've always fit very differently. They've never been the same, not because out of choice, just because... That's what you could get. That's what I could get. Yeah, and most men's physique guys want... Or most competitors, bikini girls as well, they always want a, a new bikini or they always want new shorts when they step on stage the next time. They want something to feel brand new and... And yeah, I could just never get the short. And people saying, your shorts are too baggy. They're too tight. They're too high. They're too um, wide. And I'm like, I know, I know. So my answer to that was build them myself. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but the thing is, if you're experiencing that problem, then other people in your industry and in your sport are also experiencing the problem. Oh, so definitely. because because there's a, there's a, when you find a need like that for yourself, you can yeah. build a product when you've built definitely. your profile. Yeah. How long was it along your journey that you kind of thought, right, I need to start building these other businesses now to kind of generate revenue so that when this sponsorship goes or when this goes, I'm sorted? How long was yeah. it? So that was uh, last year in the pandemic. So that all happened for me because I was... Obviously, there's a part of you that thinks about the financial side of it when you're competing and stuff. But for me, because I had my plumbing background and stuff, and that's how I earned money, this was all just like a bit of a dream. I was earning this money off sponsors, but all I wanted to do was compete. I just wanted to be the best bodybuilder in my sport. It wasn't about the financial side of it. A lot of people get into the industry now thinking they can make millions out of it. But for me, it wasn't about that. It was about... um, being the best in the world at what I do. I want to be number one, Mr. Olympia. So I never really thought about it up until lockdown. Obviously, we all we all got put into, into lockdown and just had a lot of time to think about it. And I was actually thinking, look, and when Alfie came along, 
your perspective again changes so much because you think it's not about you anymore. This kid is going to rely on you for the next 18, 20 years and you need to be able to provide for him. And, I, and again, I want to give him the best life I can. So that's when I thought all my income at the time was all through sponsorships. And with the pandemic, a lot of sponsorships, I either had to freeze sponsorship. I voluntarily froze uh, one sponsorship of mine who I had a 12-year relationship with and I just felt loyal to them and I thought, I'm going to freeze my sponsorship to, to help them get through a rough time. And I thought, this is actually quite scary. This is a scary thought that these these people could would essentially drop me overnight and I've got nothing coming in. So that's when I uh, I went to the drawing board when I was in lockdown and, and set up a few businesses. So I bought... Properties now, which I, I rent out. Um, How many properties you bought now? I've got two now. Uh, so I've got one I own and two two that I rent out. Um, that's, that's brilliant, bro. That's yeah, brilliant. I've just finished. Yeah, I've just finished it this week. The roof got finished. Yes. But again, that's my release as well. So I I love properties. So you've come from a um, a joinery background. So, so I was a, I was a carpenter and joinery yeah. by trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. So. We were instilled, I don't know if you were, but I was always instilled that to, to earn more money, you do you fit a, a tap at the weekend or that kind of... I used to go out hanging doors, mate. Yeah, that's what yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. So you fit a, an outside tap at the weekend, you get an extra 50 quid and that was absolutely buzzing. But So that was always... And I used to love going into a house like, and it was knackered and, and you'd, you'd fit essentially and you've got essentially fit and all your pipe work. And I don't... Yeah, call yeah, me yeah. sad, I know people might think, he's a weirdo, but... I used to love that feeling and I used to love renovating houses. I've, I've done quite a few houses now and I used to do all the work, a lot of the work myself, uh, not on my own house, <laughs> only on rentals and what I sell on. But I, I don't know, I just used to love that. And when I got into sports and stuff, it was always my release to be able to, to go and do something what not a lot of people know I do and it's kind of my thing. Um, so. Mate, I, 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 I fully resonate because I did English heritage work for okay. a lot of years for a company that's 110 years old in Peterborough called John Lucas. Brilliant, nice. brilliant cup dream joinery firm they've looked after peterborough cathedral for like over a hundred years nice. um when the fire happened in peterborough cathedral and we restored it right. all the oak work we had to make old look like new i fitted the main doors at the cathedral i've put in i've put in privacy screens i redid the louvres in the main tower that's amazing right? feeling. and hand hoisted hand hoisted these oak after me and mark made them in the joinery shop we hand hoisted these oak louvres up to the top of this cathedral and put them in now those louvres hadn't been changed in that cathedral yeah. for for thousands of years bro Crazy. and then when i stood back in peterborough city center the other day and i looked up at that and i'm like same with you looking at that pipe work i'm looking at it thinking fuck yeah. me i did that yeah do you know Amazing. what I mean? Like I screw, I I remember screwing that off. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so that is so true. Like, when I drive through my old town, uh, where I'm from and stuff, and you you look at vertical flues, you know, through the roof. Yeah, like, yeah. fitted that. Yeah, it's still going ten years later. <laughs> but there's, but there's a, but although me and you, we started in a trade where we've yeah. got, we've done our three or four year advanced craft apprenticeship, and we've gone out and we've worked, and we've done the weekends. I think there's something very beautiful in that. Yeah, definitely. But because because it is. Trade work like that is art, mm. and and you're. I can see by the way that you talked about doing that pipe work that you're that you're like me. You f- you finesse over the detail. Yeah, hundred percent. And it, it's 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 with you've done you've done that your whole career. For, that's you've taken that through plumbing. You've taken that through your eating. You've taken that through your bodybuilding. You yeah. take that on how you're a dad. You took that the same way in your clothing. Yeah, it's like everything's everything's about, yeah. and that all comes from how how that apprenticeship was instilled into you, yeah. and how that guy brought you through your 100%. apprenticeship. And it's one of those things: if you're going to do something, you want to do it 100, percent don't you? Like you don't want to half ass anything. And that, let's like say with my physique, everyone's like, "Why do you want to be the biggest guy in the room? Why aren't you bigger of a fighting for that bigger? That like, you know, yeah. to be the biggest guy on stage." And for me, it was never about that. Like I've, all I've ever wanted to do is build that. You're never going to get a perfect body, but you to symmetry. Build that, yeah, that symmetry and that physique, and just try and look at your physique and think, right, I want to sculpt. I need a bit more 3D on my caps, a bit more here. Like I need to bring my taper. And that was always more interesting to me than just thinking, right, I need mass. I just want to be big. Like I never yeah. wanted that. I just wanted it to be a functional physique. Um, and, and that's how, what I'm how do you, how do you look at yourself objectively and really finesse and for not uh, like you know get finickety with your own structure and how you sit in and how your body sits and how yeah. and how do you because 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 it's like it like it's hard to work on certain areas and target fats is it it's the same with 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 muscle you know yeah. sometimes you get imbalances don't you where one side of your chest is bigger yeah, than the other how do you how do you go about not you know get, correcting it but not 
getting so overly the top of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you've got to be your own worst critique, I think. And most bodybuilders are because they come back from that self confidence issue where they do look at themselves and think they need to change something about themselves physically or mentally, whatever right, it is. Yeah. So, like when I look in in the mirror, or when I'm putting a routine together and stuff, I look at what accentuates my physique or what what's not pleasing to it as well. So two sides of it and think, right, I don't want to showcase that. I need to showcase my physique in the in the best way possible. So I'll hit poses what, again, accentuate the physique. Whereas stuff, what's not as good, like for people who come to me and they've got slightly wide-waisted, never stand straight on to, uh, to the judges or whatnot. Always stand slightly off-centre. So uh, with that, Correction on your hips, you give that elongated, more tapered way. So there's loads of. You just say you just changed so many people's lives by saying that. But <laughs> if they're listening, if they're, if they're listening to this that compete, yeah. they're picking that up because yeah. that is a that that to me I'd have never thought of. Yeah, you, well, posing is massive though. There's so much to posing what people don't realise, and that's that's why you have to. I, I, I start my posing eight weeks out, and it's twenty to thirty minutes after cardio every day, and it's because. Why is it always after cardio? It's just because you're at your leanest. So right, okay. because you're fasted and you've done it after your cardio, you, you can just you can see what's closer down the line. So when you've yeah. got a full full uh, day's worth of food, it's hard to hit your midsection and you're a bit more watery because you've, you've had quite a lot in the day and stuff. So it's just showing your true potential and it's a good cardio state as well. When you're tensing, it is so... Um, Hard on calories, burning calories and stuff. It's yeah. unbelievable. So yeah. you just factor that into your cardio session before. And uh, not only that, I suppose by being hot because you got off the cardio equipment, that's equivalent to you standing on stage under them lights, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to speak, yeah. But it's just feeling that emptiness, feeling that you've not eaten, um, and, and the more you're hitting your poses, like a lot of people shaking it, it's because they haven't done any ice attention work or they haven't practiced the posing. And posing is key because you that's the difference between first and, and tenth or last place is because you can have the best physique, you could have trained the hardest in the gym, the most focused in your, your food, but if you can't showcase your physique in a certain way to its best ability, then you're, you're going to come last. So yeah. I made that mistake and I vowed I'd never do it again and, and that was my first ever show I did. Went on stage, I dieted so hard, the best I ever felt, the, the leanest I'd ever been, and I should have won that title. And uh, I came second to a guy, uh, he was world number one at the time, Rob Richards. Um, he was at Optimum, before Steve Cook, he was the number one boy at Optimum Nutrition. He, yeah. He was, um, Steve Cook's a weapon, isn't he? Yeah. But at the time, I gave it to him because he was very experienced, all that kind of stuff. And I looked, I'm looking at him like this across, and he's hitting all these poses, and I'm just trying to copy him because I didn't do any research on my posing. And... Um, yeah, and I just said I'd never do that again, and I went against him about three months later, and I beat him because of my posing was right. So that was something what I never take for granted now. Pose, pose, pose. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's so, there's so many... I, I mean, I'm learning so much here because there's so many moving parts and things that need to be taken into account to yeah. be to be the level that you're at and to, to get to the level where you're getting to. Yeah. Like, well, just touching on what you were saying before that, again, about how you, you can't... You know, when you're like trying to change your physique, and that you yeah. If you look in my early days in 2010, there's some really bad pictures on the internet from when I was 2010. But uh, you know, I own contentremover.com, don't you? <laughs> yes, Johnny was, actually, Johnny was actually telling me about that. Well, hey, come on, we need to talk about. We this. need to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, but um, the yeah. bit suspect anyway. But um, I had really thick obliques, um, lower obliques, which made me look like I had a wide waist, and they were really dense. And I remember seeing that guy I told you about who was saying like you need to lose your carbs or whatever. You. And he said to me, so, what, you got, what are these? Right? And he thought they were love handles at first, but they were solid. And it's because I was so obsessed with midsection, I did every ab exercise I could think of. So I used to, whatever, go on muscle and fitness, find every ab exercise and do them all. And I used to do weighted crunches to the side, you know, like side oblique weighted yeah, crunches. Yeah. Um, and over time, I built up my lower oblique. So they were muscle, but it, it widened my waist and I had this thick. And he said to me, Anything on your obliques, stop crunching, always twist. So wood chop, dumbbell wood chop, a cable wood chop, oblique twist, never crunching. And it was the hardest year because because they were so dominant, they kept firing up. And you could feel them firing up. You could feel the blood get there when I was doing certain exercises. So in the end, I had to do everything forward. So no oblique work. I had to just... So they were all weighted crunches or, you know, just abdominal crunches for them to, to come down. And you see in my physique from 2010 to 2012, 13. Yeah, from 2010 to 2013, you'll see how my bleaks just, yeah, come down and um, everything comes together. 
It's mad, isn't it? So, yeah, so when you're saying about how do you do that, that's what you do. You, you have a coach who's, who's going to you just right, got to have people that are honest to call you out on this yeah. stuff, haven't you, really? Yeah, because like Max O'Connor, um, again, he was a super heavy, a class two super heavyweight. Uh, he was on the, the team I was with, and he had such dominant legs, massive, amazing legs. Uh, but they overpowered his upper half. Most people that obviously died for his legs or his upper half, but he came to the drawing, he had to stop training legs for six months to, to bring them down to match his upper half. And so, so that's kind of what bodybuilding is about, is trying to perfect the, so to speak, perfect physique. Mate, it's, li- <laughs> it's literally like, you got to hit 70,000 different points yeah. to be able to even even comprehend being anywhere even close. Yeah. Did yeah, there is, and it, that's what was frustrating though. If, if you know, like in the industry, I'm not going to name names, but like s- some people that, like, like in the open class, they used to like ridicule men's physique guys, like, oh, you need to train three months and step on stage and it's easy, and they've got a lot of dedication. But I train and eat so religiously, like a bodybuilder has for the last 20 years, and I'm by far not the biggest guy or anything like that, but it is, yeah, it's a, it's a sport you do take seriously. What about what about all the, the gear that you? Do you obviously have to take a lot of gear to get to get into these no, shapes? Not at all. No, obviously open class. They, um, yeah, they they have to take a lot, and and that's what's taking a lot of stick at the minute. Because I don't know if you know, it's in the past year or so. There's a lot of a lot of bad rap, a lot of grey area with, with bodybuilding. Because people minute. go after. I see people going after Mike Thurston on YouTube and people like that, and and on gear and stuff like that. But then I think to myself. Well, potentially he might be, and potentially, obviously, you guys might have to do a little bit of gear. But when I was speaking to Sam Pierce about this, he's like, "Do you know what, Frankie? I take gear. Obviously, he takes gear. Right. He's like, I take gear, but I take minimal compared to what these uh, gym bros are taking. Yeah, yeah. Because, because like a lot of the top guys are taking gear, but they're taking a lot less than what you, you think. Yeah. What, what you think? Yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult because. Like you say, gym bros or whatnot, you go into a gym and there's always that one guy who says, you need this, 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 this. And people are influenced by it. And it's the wrong, um, they're getting the wrong information out there. And then people are getting hurt and stuff. But on the other side of it, you're looking at the, the open class. And we have had quite a lot of, of deaths recently and stuff. And yeah. it has put a bit of a, a tarnish on, on bodybuilding, which is a shame. It's, it's that expectation each year. Where do you go when, when someone's a certain size, certain condition, certain shape? Yeah. Where do you go from there? Certain vascularity, like right, it needs to be the same guy but just bigger, and the next one, same guy but bigger, because that's how divisions evolve. You look at men's physique when we were small; it was supposed to be that attainable beach look, stepping what? on Bondi Beach and whatnot, and it yeah. was, that was how it started. Steve Cook was was the poster boy for that because he was like more smooth. He, he was holding yeah. muscle. Don't get me yeah. wrong; he had a lot of muscle, but he was that attainable. Like I could look like that guy. Whereas now, men's physique, you you wouldn't look at Brandon Hendricks and think, oh, I could look like him. You know, yeah, like I, I kind of back in the day at the top end of town. When you look at people like Frank Zane, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, people like that, that was kind of to me that looked really good. And then now I look at people like even like people like Ronnie Coleman. Yeah, I love the guy, but like yeah. Ronnie Coleman's and the Phil Heaths and all that stuff. That's not the same to me. No, that's too. But, that's too dense. That's yeah. too. That's too round. But that. But Dorian changed that. Dorian Yates changed that. Obviously, to be the mass monster. That that's when the era changed. But if you if you did a poll, most people like even a lot of the men's physique guys, they're heavier than Frank Zane was, who's Mr. Olympia, yeah. like now. So you can see how the the sport has evolved so much. Like men's physique, we're classed as the small babies in the group. We we would have been Mr. Olympia back then in the seventies or whatever. So things have evolved and changed. But when um, classic physique came out, I think that was a big. That's going to be a big turning point because that is probably one of the most popular divisions now. I think ours has got the most traction men's physique has because more people can enter it and more people can relate to it more. It's, it, it's more like if you if you were a young lad training at the gym, like say, say I was 18 and I was looking at you, I, I, I look at you and I appreciate how much work's gone into it and I know how much work's gone into it, but at least I can think it's, to myself, oh, it's half yeah, obtainable. Exactly. It's half obtainable. Exactly. And that's why men's physique has been so popular and is so popular. It's because of that, that people still have that hope of I could look like that one day. That is achievable. Uh, and and but that's when, so going back to with Classic, when that came out, that's like took over Open Class now. Like uh, It's sad to say because I am a big fan of Open Class, so I don't want to stand here and, and criticise Open Class at all. I've got a lot of friends in, in Open Class, but Classic Physique is where it probably should cap nowadays. Nowadays, Because you look at Bumstead, um, he's a phenomenal, but he is big, but he's phenomenal. He's got a tight waist, he can vacuum, he's 
he's functional, he's healthy looking on stage, uh, and that's kind of where bodybuilding used to be in I mean, its the, pinnacle. The biggest guy that I've ever seen that's actually really functional is Kai Green. Like yeah, that, 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 that guy. That, 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 that guy is, is the most gymnastic yeah. type. You'd never expect it looking at him. Yeah, decent but, dance moves. Dance but moves. He, 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 I think he got a bit of a raw deal with some of the losses he's had at top level. Yeah, I think with, with Kai, he didn't help himself off stage. Um, he's, he's a nice guy. It's all, like it's, all, it's all about who's mates with who in bodybuilding as well too, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. But uh, you've got the, the world of bodybuilding, everybody looking at you because they're essentially the, the top the king of, of, of the world, of, of bodybuilding world. So you've got Phil Heath and Kai Green who are fighting it out, and either one of them could have had it. But you've got Phil Heath, who's the ex-basketball player, very speaks very well, uh, boy next door, that kind of, you know, that American... Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas Kai, he was, he was quite aggressive. He, he was a bit outspoken. I won't say he was aggressive, but I, he was quite... Um, In your face. Yeah, and some of the things he came out with, he was like... Oh, what? <laughs> Did I understand that? You know, like he was just a bit out there. He and had it, a, he it, had a hard childhood. Yeah, exactly. Hard childhood. I'm and sure. I'm sure he went into. A, I thought he was, he was in a f- care. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was just a different kind of thing. So when you're looking at both of them and the whole picture, that's I think that's what tipped it for Phil. Don't get me wrong. Phil had a, a, he's got a phenomenal physique, but Kai did as well. And at times you thought Kai might have got that, but. In the whole picture, it's not just about being on stage. There's other there's other factors, um, yeah. And I think that's what played a big part in, in Kai coming second a lot. Yeah, no, no, I, f- I feel that. I just I don't know if you ever heard about the watermelon um, situation. Nah, go on. Oh no, <laughs> go on. Most guys will know about that, but you have to just type it in. Go, go. That, that oh might. god, that, you can't say it. <laughs> that, that might show why you might not want it. Go, go, go on. <laughs> Tell me. No, no, no. Just put Kai Green watermelon. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> God damn! Don't don't. Look, oh, Kai, so, Kai's going to kill me for bringing that back up. I'm oh, sorry, mate. I, say, I, don't, I don't even I want to brought that. I up. don't even. If I end up on Pornhub after that search, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Possibly. <laughs> oh, we were going so well yeah, too. We were going so. Well. But you but brought me down. I brought I brought, I brought, I brought Ryan Terry <laughs> d- d- down down to the dark Not side. Good. But mate, what are some of the things that you've done that have been that are really empowered and ingrained your mindset to go and go and achieve what you've achieved that you could give like as tools to people to, to help them refine and elevate their mindset so they can go and achieve what lights them up. Um, I, th- I think for me, fi- find a passion, find something that you're very passionate about. So if it's in, if it's in a certain career, well, don't be afraid to just jump in and, and have a go because if you're passionate about it, Nine times out of ten, you're going to make it work. And if you don't make it work first time, you'll make it well, make it the second time. And when it comes to like competing, you've got to live it. You've got to live and breathe competing. A lot of people think it's a 12-week prep and, and they're done. Whereas it's not. It's a lifestyle. And you've got to enjoy the process because it's it's not about the, the end result. It's about the journey as well because you're going to be constantly living in trying to chase something when when you want to enjoy the journey. I don't, I don't I'm not very good yeah. at speaking, trying to explain what I mean, but... I, I very early on, I started bodybuilding, not because I wanted to compete. I started bodybuilding for self-confidence and for myself and to enjoy it and to, to live that lifestyle. I loved eating regimented and I loved what it did f- for my physique and my confidence and all that. And it, it became my lifestyle. And then that's when I, I felt like, right, there's something missing. I need something, that competitive side. And that's when I decided to bring competing in shows, in bodybuilding, into to what I was doing. And that's what I would say. I said, don't rush the process and don't think you need to do it overnight. Enjoy the process and, and you'll get there if you believe you can. How you, how did you kind of find exactly what your kind of mission, purpose, structure was? Still Is haven't it? found that. <laughs> still haven't found it. No, no, go on. Sorry, Cam. No, but, but how, did you find, how did you find, you know, a lot of people would DM me and say, and see what I'm doing now, and I've got my own reasons for this, and I say, oh, you know, how did you find your purpose, Frankie? How did you find what lights you up? And I always say to people, you know, you've got to try lots of things and, and be willing to fail lots of times in order yeah. to find what you want to do. But from your perspective, from someone that's achieved so much at so many different things now, what? how do you How do you suggest people go and find their purpose, go and find what's, what's right for them? Yeah, it's, it's difficult because obviously when I was growing up, when I met my dad um, for the first time, I found out like his family background, I found out everything about him. And my mum and dad met in the fire brigade and he was in the fire brigade for 50, uh, 35 years. All his brothers, so all my uncles, five, five brothers, all, all in, the, um, 
in the fire brigade. I've got a picture of my great great granddad, my granddad, all these people, and everybody started in the fire brigade. So it kind of fell on me to be to carry to pass the torch on from my dad when he retired and to carry on in the fire brigade. So that's kind of what I thought I had to do and stuff. But I always had that sporting that that um, that competitive edge. So although I wanted to make my dad proud and stuff, it just wasn't for me. But I started to go down that route. I started to uh, to enrol myself and stuff, and I just. I quickly found out that's that's just not what inspires me. And eighty percent of your your work of your day is is in work. And is that what I'm going to do to to please my dad and, and to carry on a tradition, or I'm going to do something for me? So I, I set a long term goal and then short term goals in order to achieve that. So at the time, mine was one to obviously be confident in my own skin, and that yeah. was why I started training the way I did. But secondly, was to be to be financially dependent where I had a, a detached house with a mortgage paid for uh, with a family all that kind of stuff and in order to get to that what was I good at and I was good at plumbing I was good at hard work and stuff and in a trade and and at the time when I thought right what can I do plumbing was the best the the most paid yeah uh, trade at the time so that's why I went into that and I knew when I was on on jobs doing heating bashing, which was horrible, by the way, where you have to do a, a heating in in one day, which is rough, but we used to have to do that. Yeah, so we'd be there thirteen in, hour days. Sometimes. In in the UK, what what Ryan's talking about is where oh, you sorry, go yeah. where you go into a house and you you fit a boiler and you run in all the new you rip out all the old pipes and you you run all the pipes, the rads and the boiler all in one day. All in one day, yeah. yeah. A team of three. And if you, any snags or anything, you've still got to do it in that day. So it could be a 10-hour day or a 13-hour day, whatever it is. But so, but in saying that, just before you go on, yeah. that, that is like a £2,500 job, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I've lost my train of thought now, mate. Sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, oh, yeah, I forgot what I was trying to say. Um, I just wanted to give people a bit of context <laughs> just quickly on, on, on what that all was because obviously I wanted to really paint that really, yeah. really paint that picture because yeah, obviously, obviously yeah. yeah carry on sorry yeah no no so yeah so remember so so that was me doing that because it was the most paid job but when I was in there doing that heating bash and I was realising that's not my passion that's not what I want to do in life and I realised to get to, to that I need to find a different avenue and stuff and, and that's why I went a different way and like you say you've got to try loads of different things and find something what does resonate with you something you, you would enjoy doing so not a lot of people in this world are fortunate enough to do their job what they love doing something they love as a job but I was determined to make that happen no matter what so when I was doing the, the jobs up and down the country for Muslim fitness for, for nothing I nearly lost my house like I had a house um it was only a £400 mortgage, <laughs> but at the time, I wasn't earning anything, and I was really struggling, the recession hit and stuff, but I was determined to have the life I want um, at that time, so I just kept trying different things, different avenues, until I found what I wanted to do, and, and bodybuilding, I was very fortunate at the time that it gave me an avenue to earn money from it as well. Yeah, and that's an avenue that you built out of bodybuilding for yourself, mm. and it's like, it's. I mean, from the outside looking in, at your early days when you weren't earning money and it's like my early days with this podcast and stuff you know when there's n- when there's no money in the game yeah but you're r- massively passionate about yeah. it and you know it's the right thing for you there's lots of people that can say t- that can kind of discourage you from yeah. pursuing that because there isn't this this yeah. and this yeah definitely and it's like how can people it, how can people find out enough about themselves from your experience to be able to push past that because that's what I think people struggle with. It's knowing enough about self and knowing who the fuck you are yeah. to be able to go, do you know what, Nat, I know where I'm going. I know I'm on, I'm on the right track. And even though I'm not where I am today, right, yeah. then that I can push through that because I know myself. How do you think people can know more about themselves and trust themselves? <sighs> that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a difficult one. Um, for me, I, I think it's... Everything you do in life, you learn from it, don't you? So all the experiences you do in life and stuff. And if you're not, you, you, you've got to, I don't know how to explain it. You've got to do things what push you out of your comfort zone. Um, things that scare you in order to, to yeah. keep going forward. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense, I don't know what I'm trying to say. But I've always been someone who, yeah, if something scares me, I need to do it. I have to attack. So I was always scared to, to do a bungee jump. I don't know if this is relevant, but things like that, anything like that, 
scared to do a bungee jump, so I had to force myself to go and do it. I was scared to step on stage. I, the, my biggest fear was stepping on stage in front of a crowd of people, my top off. Like I would have never done it in a million years, but I just felt like anything in life what what scares me. I need to hit it head on because you're going to learn from it. If you even if you you don't succeed or get the result you want out of it, you're still learning from it. It's a life experience you've just done and you've learned from it, and you can say right, these are the the fundamentals I need to take away from this this uh, scenario, and it's it's like it's right what you're saying because I think at, at any one time when you when you even think about anything that you've done, even when you did even when you, when you walked in that gym and did your first bicep curl and you don't really know what you're doing and you're not you're not twisting at the top and you're not pausing or whatever, yeah. you, do you know what I mean? And you don't you haven't got that technique refined. In fact, you don't even know the technique. Yeah, isn't that scary? So what what I'm trying to say to everyone who's listening to this is like. Everything that you do for the first time, in essence, is yeah. is is. Oh, it can be scary. It can be it can. this, yeah. that, and the other. You know, all this stuff. It's like the first it's, it's, when I had the first woman on this podcast way back on like episode. I think it was like episode eleven or something like that. It's like you know, I had Ellie Gonzalez come on the podcast. You know, a model. She's been in fighting with my family with The Rock. Obviously, I knew her from the gym, and, and she'd agreed to come on. But I was like, "Fuck! I've never spoken to a woman on a podcast before." Yeah, yeah, of like, I, it's, it's like my first. It's my yeah. first time. Obviously, I've spoken to lots of women in my life. Yeah, but you never spoke. It's, 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 you have to learn that. You have to. You, you have to go and. Yeah, ha- it's it, and don't shy away from it. Yeah, and, and attack it head on. Like for me, talking. Um, in front of people as well, like even stuff like this, I get nervous about because I'm not from that background. Like I've, I am a nervous, I'm a nervous competitor. I'm a nervous person. So for me to do stuff like this is challenging in itself. Um, I, I learned over the years to, to, to do like speak, you know, speaking in, in audiences and with thousands of people. But every day I get so scared about doing stuff like that. But you can either sit in your comfort zone and not get yourself out there and, and do it or you can just face it head on and what? stepping on the Olympia stage I'm like this backstage you've got all the uh, the competitors a lot of the Americans cool, suave just in their zone just loving life and what, I'm like this absolutely shitting myself thinking I'm stepping on stage in front of all these people but I just walk out and as soon as I go out and those lights hit you and stuff Everything comes back to me like, right, 16 weeks of hard graft. You've got your your family in the audience. You've got all these people supporting you from the UK and believed in you for the last 12 years of your career. Now it's time to shine. And your alter ego comes out and I just attack it head on. And then I get off stage and I'm like this again. What the hell happened? Yeah. Um, but it's just something I've always done. Like if something scares me, I just I go at it head on instead of running away from it. I th- and uh, and uh, in, in, in guys, if you're listening to that, I think that's your answer. And it? it's like running, run run into stuff in your life and don't let any of this stuff like hold you back or you know you've got there's no reason why you can't achieve anything I mean look Mm. when I'm hassling people like yourself for I I felt bad the other like because I'm like you know Ryan let's do this podcast right like Johnny I need to speak to Ryan like I'm (laughs) I'm hustling I'm hustled I'm I've hustled like hell to get this podcast done to to get in the room to meet you in the first place to, to, to because and the reason why I do it and I'm like fuck these people must must hate me a little bit <laughs> but the reason the reason I chase it so hard is because I believe when I get the when I get people like yourself on the podcast I believe that I can help them articulate their story and tell yeah. their story in a way that's never been done before to allow the audience to get so much out of it and hopefully provide value to them as well yeah, definitely. so that's what that's why I hassle you so much, you know what I mean? Like, when, when, do you know, in the lead yeah, up no. to like this kind it's of stuff. because you're passionate about it as well. Yeah, you know what yeah. we're talking about before is because you want this to be a success and it is a success because of how passionate you are about yeah. it. And that's, yeah, that's what you need to take away from it. Anything you want to do, you have to just put 100% into it and believe you can do it. Yeah. I, I do. And, and that, yes, yeah, so I was just saying that's something I lost belief in myself. I'm not going to lie. With the Olympia, every title I've ever gone for, I've never been that guy who's really cocky. He's like, yeah, I'm having that title. But I've always believed in the back of my head that it, I can achieve that. That's mine. That's my my title to have. Whereas the the Olympia, the last few times, I've just, yeah, I just lost that fire, lost that belief in myself. I was still turning up, getting my top five, walking away. Yeah, happy days. That'll that'll do me for next year. But where where did that become acceptable in my head? Whereas like growing up, that was never acceptable. You're right. your first place or not, and you attack it with everything you've got. And I lost that. I don't really tell many people that I did lose that, and that's why I wanted to give up the Olympics. I was thinking. I'm just going to damage my reputation and, and everything I've worked towards and, and worked hard for. Um, and it was only, yeah, like I say, this year, something just switched. And I was like, no, I've, I've got this back. This is mine now. I'm having this. 
mate, I t- I've told you open and honestly before, similar thing. You know, I've, I've sat in my car crying, mate, because I'm like, fuck, I put so much time and effort and energy into that. I resonate with what you've yeah. just said there. Everything you said just hits me, man. Oh, good. Because, because, because and, and it'll hit so many people that are listening to this because what you've just said there is so true. It's like, you've got to find that fire within yourself all the time yeah. and you've got to keep putting coal on it you've got to keep stoking that yeah. fire otherwise that fire will go, will out. go out yeah and you, what have you found then to to reignite that for me it was a new lease of life um little man that, that obviously that that for me before it was just about being the best in the world selfish i just wanted to be everybody on this planet and stuff whereas things have changed like with alfie having a wife and stuff wanted to to do it for those reasons but i'm i'm so fired up and motivated again now because i like being the underdog i don't know what it is and and you should yeah. never you should never really have that attitude because you want to be top dog and everyone chasing you yeah. but for me i've always liked to work in the shadows in darkness in quiet where where no one's watching no one's even thinking about you're a top 5 uh, contender and that's what happened um at the arnold it, it just, I don't know, there's something felt different this year. I just, I'm back down the ranks a bit I now. I see it in you, man. Yeah, I'm I back down it. the ranks and I'm like, I'm not that top contender anymore. Because when, when I was like fighting for, for first place, I was second in the world, Arnold Classic champion, all in the same year. I'd moved to America. All the hype was on me. People, a lot of my friends from America, uh, a lot of my friends from Australia came over from South Africa. Uh, we had a massive entourage of team. I didn't know they were turning up. They all, and the pressure and, and it just... It took it away from me being an underdog, just going in and doing the work, and 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 that's yeah. And I kind of lost that because it became so much about everything else, everybody else, sponsors, all that kind of stuff. Whereas people are past that now, which is I'm fine with. I'm absolutely happy with that because I can now do my thing where I can work in the shadows and, and do what I need to do, and and I like working like that. I think I think there's a lot to be said for the the work that you can put in behind the scenes when, when nobody's watching. Definitely. You know well, that's mean? where it, that's, that's exactly where everything's where earned. At. Yeah. 100%. There's so much activity that I take and that you take that people don't see. Yeah. Definitely. That people would never understand. But that's the same as like your career and stuff. Like we were talking about how much graft you've put into this before. So people see how successful it is now, but they won't see where you've come from or how hard it was to, to get it set Fucking up. It's or, still hard, man. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> but the same for me. People like look at like where I'm at and stuff like that and they think, oh, you, you've got it made, you've got it easy and stuff. But when I, when I, I was with a company called USM for 12 years and when I joined them, I was, yeah. I was still plumbing all that kind of stuff. I wasn't getting paid or anything. I was essentially a salesman for them. I used to... Every day, I was up and down the country, I'd do a, a tour of Scotland, so Edinburgh, Glasgow, Glasgow, Firth, all those places, and then I'd be down to like Brighton, and then do, um, and I was just, I'd, I'd be in uh, like sports centres, I'd be in uh, retired, uh, where people are coming for a swim, OAP's coming for a swim, and I'd be trying to sell a protein bar out of a vending machine to them, so that was how I started, and I'd be in the middle of Birmingham, you know, where... Uh, the ball, ball ring centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to sell, like giving shots of protein out and stuff. And I was doing that every day. So I was essentially selling it. But that was hard graft. But no one saw, sees that side of it. They just used to say, oh, you're a poster boy for USM. But I was like, yeah, but you hadn't seen the, the 12 years before that of me working through the ranks and, and grafting my, my nuts off and not having much of a social life because I was on the road through the middle of the night all the time. And I just never said no because, one, I loved it. But two, I knew where I wanted to be and what I wanted to be. And, and you never know who you're going to meet in yeah. those situations you, so true you never know who you're going to meet and sometimes you've got to say yes to you got i think i think the essence is you got to know you got if you if you can find if you can if you can get 95 percent clear or 99 percent clear mm. on what you want for yourself by sitting there with a journal and writing it down and being really okay this is how i want my life to look if you can get yeah. that right you can kind of know and feel into what you should say yes and what you should say no to. Yeah. And it's like, at that time of USN, you knew that you had to say yes to these opportunities because you didn't know what else was coming on the back yeah. of it. And I needed to prove my worth because I, I, I knew the company I was with. I, I understood their background, their ethics, and where they came from with South Africa and how hard they work. And I was like, for me to be successful, I need to show them that I'm part of the team and yeah. that I'm willing to bend over backwards for them. And I did that through everything. Like, even when I was pot washing at night, I was the guy, I was a waiter at first in a black shirt, you know, just handing drinks out, handing meals out. But they, one night they fell short, the pot washer got sacked, he turned up late and stuff. And it, it was dirty, scruffy, you know, horrible job. And I stepped in because I was like, I'll do it and stuff. And 
I was then, I, I used to have a toothbrush and we used to do uh, potato peeling. I don't know if you've ever been yeah, in the like, yeah, back yeah. of a pub or restaurant. In the cellar, they used to have potato peeling and stuff, these machines, and it's splattering everywhere, gunk and whatnot, and, and changing all the barrels, there's just shit everywhere. I used to scrub them every night, scrub all the floors and whatnot, clean all the uh, the fridges out and what. Never said a word, and it'd give me an extra pint at night. You know, after I'd finished, it'd give me a pint or an extra tenner at the end of the week. In my, and that meant so much to me because... He was appreciating what I was doing, and that was the same for USM. Yeah. When I was working, they appreciated what I did, and and they helped me. They put me in uh, magazines. They, they, they supported when I was competing. They supported my airfare and, and things like that. And it's just it nice just, to be seen, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it wasn't always about one one sided. It was always about grafting and helping each other both grow in the industry. And I think nowadays. I don't want to stereotypically like, say the younger generation, but it seems to be like everyone's out for themselves a little bit. Where it's like. No, I, I'm this superstar now. I'm doing it for myself. Whereas in my era, which has changed, which I say my era, <laughs> 10, 12 years ago, it wasn't about that. It was just everyone bringing it together, you know, bringing it all well, together. Well, the, 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 the thing what I try and explain to people is, and obviously I've been lucky enough to meet through my work and through doing the podcast and everything else. I'm lucky enough to have met different people at the highest echelons of like social media and stuff like yeah. that. It's like, you know, Kayla Itzinez, you know, a good fr- friend of mine. She's like one of the world's top fitness models. She's she's the nicest nicest yeah. girl that you'll ever meet, right? Yeah. Just loves her family. She invited me around the house in Adelaide, all that stuff, yeah. And it's like people like yourself, you know, highest echelon of the game, real nice, real humble. What I've found is, you know that, that kind of 50, 60, 70,000, 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 follower echelon, mm. The ones that kind of have a real big fucking ticket on themselves that are on the way up yeah. are where are a little bit younger and a little bit more green round the ears. Yeah, they can be fucking assholes. <laughs> like in terms, of like you know, like, and it's just, it's just. It's but just, do you think it might be? Do you think it might be the fact that, like, for instance, we've come from like a labouring back. This is what I've always wondered. This is why I'm going to ask you about this. So, do you think it possibly from? From a young age, so obviously we were grafting like yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, it's a proper hard in that graft. garage there, mate. In yeah. that garage there, I did it from when I was six with my dad. <laughs> but that's what I mean. So it was hard graft and stuff. So you appreciate the value of it, and you appreciate where you're at. Yeah. And I think sometimes, like the some of the younger guys coming through, they've never had that hardship. So they, they'll do some YouTube videos, they'll do something they enjoy, one, and they, they earn some big money out of it. They get this fame overnight, and it's kind of like it's it's expected now. Um, have, you been, should... have you been to Australia? Yeah. Few yeah. times, yeah, and you've seen the kind of life that they have over there, yeah. Bloody brilliant, right? It, it, it <laughs> is, it is bloody brilliant, yeah. and you know, I've got a massive listenership over there. But one of the downfalls of having such privilege from such an early age, in terms of like your environment, the money, the yeah. wealth, everything else, is that piece. You miss that piece. Yeah, I'm not saying there's not people that come from hardships in Australia. I'm not saying that. No, but yeah, what I'm saying course. is, as a as a country, it's very affluent. It's probably yeah. the luckiest country in the world, I'd yeah. say. Yeah, as a country, I think it's a little bit fucking harder over yeah. here, and a little bit harder in other areas. And yeah, I think definitely. I think that hardness is what breeds the humbleness and what breeds the worth ethic that allows you to achieve that. And when you get there, to kind of realise and be thankful yeah. for what you've achieved. Yeah, I've, I've been on so many shoots of, of late the last year or so. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm with the young, I'm the older guy now in the group, which is scary, like click and I'm, I was always the younger one, but now we click and I'm the older guy. And it just little things like turning up, we're all there on, on site, on site, <laughs> <They're> on set, <laughs> on set, on set, on site. on set for like nine o'clock, all starting, the massive production team's ready to go, and they're not turning up till 12 or half 12, and I'm thinking, can't if I'd do have that. done that in the, yeah, if I'd done that in any job I'd had, you'd have been sat in the real world, you'd have been sacked, wouldn't you? Like, yeah. Whereas in this world, it's very different. It's, it's a, yeah. I, just, I just think you should operate from the term that you are not your followers. Yeah. Because I think, like, it, it's, it's literally like, kindness, humbleness, like, don't get me wrong, I say some bantery things on social media. Like, before you came here, I I bloody did a story saying, you know, bald guys are back in fashion and all this <laughs> stuff. Right, right. Just yeah. a bit of banter, isn't it? But, like, so many people have, have, have such a, a, a massive, um, a built-up opinion of themselves and this, that, and the other. And it, by instilling this without context, what you do is you build a barrier between you and others. Yeah. And then, and then you can't resonate. The reason why you've built such a big brand, and whilst 
whilst you've done so well and all that is because of the connection you have with your community yeah. and and that's why brands like Gymshark and, and, and other brands like that will, will come on board and get on the boat yeah. with you yeah. bec- because because you are that connection with that yeah. resonates with that audience that, that's something I, I've missed especially in lockdown and where the way social media has gone now so gone are the days really of expos do you remember expos that's yeah, how I built body my, power yeah but that's how I built my my name in the industry because I used to love having that interaction and talking to, to, to people about their their careers, their fitness journeys and all that and, and having that. And I used to get told off from a lot of my sponsors because I, I'm the guy who wouldn't let the, the people go, you know, in the queuing up to, to talk yeah. to you. Normally they're rushing everyone on. I'm the guy who's keeping them because I want to hear everything about them. Right? And I, I buzz off that and meeting people and, and having that interaction has been amazing. So with lockdown and then obviously with social media becoming such a powerful thing, I think that's taken the element out of, of the sports industry now. So it's more about followers and likes on, on a on a post rather than having that one-to-one. So and it's not it, the same, is it? No, it's not. Not for me anyway. Someone who's, who's really heavily into to social media then it, it is it's personable it it's, to you it's personable yeah, you want I, to be out on the ground meeting that's people. why I rang you you know when you set up out being on a, on a zoom call I no no to, I didn't say zoom <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I was because I thought when you said um, an invite yeah automatically because I do that many zoom calls a week now I automatically thought oh does he want to do this via zoom I'm like so that I want to come and talk to you. I want to meet you, shake your hands. So, so, uh, so obviously me and you met in the gym yeah. for the first time when I was over here, obviously earlier, earlier on this summer. And, um, I said to you about coming on the podcast. Yeah. And when you said, when you, when you messaged, when you messaged me, I was like, I'll send you an invite. I meant a calendar invite. Right. He thought, he thought I was, he thought I was going to have him on zoom. I'm like, bro, I don't want to do this. He brings me up. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to do it on fucking zoom. I don't want to do it on zoom. You've got to like shake your hand. Yeah. yeah. I've got, I've got, have a good I've chat. Got, mate, I've been fucking, I've been manifesting this for two years. I'm not doing it on fucking zoom. Like, you know what I'm saying? I've been obsessing over this for two years. <laughs> do, you know what? Do, you, do you know what I'm saying though? Yeah, like, you know, it's, it's just, it's just great to be able to, to be able to come and mm. th- th- this podcast um, that we've put down today, I, I can just every time you you say certain things, I'm like, man, that's going to drop in so many people's ears, and I can Hopefully. see I can see people's mindset and, and and certain people certain things changing their lives, which is which is a beautiful thing for a host like me to to kind of because I hear it when it drops live, and well, and, cool. and you can't and you can't. Put a I, was, I was actually on that. nervous about talking about certain things because I don't want to be a guy. I've ne- I've always been conscious of what I put out on social media and stuff because I never be one of that, that negative guy I don't want to be the guy who's God he's got a monotone boring voice I wish he'd shut up so I'm glad you've said that because I, all the way through this I'm thinking oh, should I be saying this is, is this going to be but, a bit but boring for people to, to listen to there's two types of people in the world there's people in the world that think there's there, there's so that there's too much value in more than in what they say yeah which are which is you know some of those people I talked about before in, in the Instagram world right and then there's people that don't really understand how much value they have and it's like I only try and get people on like yourself because I know how much value you've got and social media and YouTube and all that stuff that you do doesn't allow you the 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 the, the context to be able to drop the true value that I believe that you had in the world. Yeah. And that's why I why I try and get people like yourself on this podcast is because I want you to be able to showcase that. Which yeah. which 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 is a beautiful thing for me to see because I've seen sides of you and I know the audience is going to see sides to you that they've never heard before. Yeah. Then they won't hear. Because it's, funny, be- it's funny you saying that because I, I've got a videographer now, a guy who, who I work close with, is a friend of mine, and he's saying all the time, saying, try to be yourself more. Just be relevant. Just say what's on your mind. Be that person people want to see because they'll be more personable. They'll, they'll understand more. They'll, they'll resonate with you a lot just more. Just be yourself, innit? But yeah, I always struggle. I think, yeah, but does, do they really want it? Because he's going, just put a picture of your coffee up and say what you're having and stuff. Just little things like that. It's just to bring people into your world. But I'm like... Do people really want to know what, you know what I'm doing, or if uh, this is the actual real me? <laughs> mate, I've literally, literally mate. Uh, like you know, I just like I just said to you before. I've just done a story on Instagram, just yeah. t- tell, telling the world why ball geese are underrated, <laughs> and, that, and that why we've come into fashion this summer, right, and why okay. and why. Well, I just literally said, I need to stop over. I'm like, girls, you need to you need to run down to your local wherever you wherever you go, and you got. To, Pick yourself out a good one with a good shaped head because they're running out. They're going to be rarer than hen's teeth this summer, right? Do you know what I mean? I'm just ban- yeah. I'm just bantering, right? But 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 but, but like because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, cool. But like it, it doesn't. What I'm saying, Ryan, is the fact of like people overthink everything about how they got to be and how they got to be. How's about we all just start? 
being our true selves and, yeah. and leaning into whatever, whatever, you know, our positives and our potential negatives are and all that stuff. It's like, just be you. Yeah. And that's, that is the whole reason why the, the tagline to this podcast is break patterns and flip perspectives. Cause I want every one of you that listens and gets to this point to, to break a pattern and flip a perspective in their life so they can go and implement it so that they can go and make their life better for whatever that is to them. I don't know what fucking lights you up. Yeah. I, d- I don't pretend to know what lights everyone up. All I want you guys to do that listen to this is like, listen to it and be like, do you know what? That's just flicked a switch in my head. And now I can change that part of my life and I can move myself forward. And then I can always relate that change to, oh, that podcast that Ryan and Frankie changed my life in that respect. I mean, I'm actually inspired by that. Keep talking. No, mate, honestly, <laughs> that, like, like, that, that, that's, that, that I would not be able to get up and do it and not, I wouldn't be able to keep fighting to get people like yourself on if I didn't fucking think yeah, that. If it do you know what I mean? And yeah, that, that's definitely. what I believe is a fundamental difference. And that's why you should like, subscribe and everything, share it with all your friends because that, do it. because it's not a podcaster in this country or born from his mother that loves it as much as me. I tell you straight down the line, that's it. But if <laughs> yeah. there was one piece of golden wisdom, Ryan, right? If you're leaving the planet tomorrow, you're checking out, you can't leave nothing behind, but you can just leave a piece of golden wisdom, something that you can impart on the next generation that you know is going to help them take their life forward and flip it into, into, into something bigger. What would it be? Oh, I don't say that. I'm terrible at stuff like on the spot. Um, what would it be? Um, Probably touching on everything we keep going back to, which is passionate. Find something you're passionate about. And it doesn't have to be a monetary value. It doesn't have to be about earning money. It, it can be just something you love and enjoy and want it to be a part of your life. And and just roll with it, go with it, and, and live and breathe it. Because that's what I did about bodybuilding. That's why I became successful in what I did, because I loved every minute of it. I loved every aspect of it, the, the lows and the highs. I learned from them, and yeah, and I built the, the life I wanted to build. I love it, man. I love it. And mate, I'd love to, yeah, a hundred percent. And I I really want to say like to you, thank you so much for, for coming here today and just, and just being, and and giving, and giving the audience a real understanding of yourself and, and your your whole, your whole life and journey, mate, because I, I, I felt this way before we ever met, way before we ever did it. I felt that this would be this way I and, and uh, that. I appreciate you. you turning up and, and, and no a disappointment so thank you no mate, <laughs> mate there's no there's nothing there's, there's no di- there's no disappointments here mate Good. there's no disappointments hey no, if that. you were disappointed I'm still here <laughs> I'm joking I'm joking. I'm joking I'm joking yeah I'm joking <laughs> but guys do me do me a, do me a solid favour yeah do me a solid solid favor right i'm trying to grow i know you probably some of you are listening to this on spotify and apple because i've got a lot more listeners on spotify and apple than i have on youtube but i'm really trying to grow this youtube channel so even if you listen to it on spotify and apple which are, which are which are which are i encourage you to subscribe to like uh review add a review on apple that would be really powerful for me but if you could just go and 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 and, and like and subscribe on youtube as well drop a comment under the youtube help me push that channel i'm really really trying to grow that youtube channel i I want to get it to like 10,000 subscribers. I mean, that's my dream at the moment because I'm not nowhere near and, and, and I'm trying to grow it. So that would, that would be sensational. And, and you know, the, you could do that in a day for me, the amount of people that listen on Apple and Spotify. So you could do that in a day for me, um, if not more. So just do that. Do me a solid favor. And if anything that me and Ryan have said, I want us to I want to drop us a message. Let us know how this resonated for you. I'm sure there's little bits that you've taken away. Some of the bodybuilders are, 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 that listen out there, um, there's certain things that Ryan says throughout this podcast that should really drop on your ears. The little one, they're what I call like the 0.1% skills that kind of can really shift how you're posing and, you know, just tweaking to the side and stuff like that. It's just, it's just so much in this. And I hope to hell that you guys get as much value out of this as, and, and can feel as much passion as I, as I love it as, as much as I do. So thank you, Ryan. It was a fucking absolute honor. No problem. Thank you for uh, having me. Just promise me one thing before we go. Just what is it? I'm, I'm going to ask you one thing. Go on. Then. When you win yeah. the Olympia, yeah. I want to be the first podcast that you step on. Okay. I thought he was going to say a shout out on stage to me. No, no, no. So, whoa, come on. Let's lower that expectation a little bit. No, no, no. Not a shout out. No, I'm saying I want to be the first podcast. Let's do it. And we can. Is that agreed? We shake. We shook on it. All right. YouTube, you've seen it. Spotify, Apple, you've heard it. Much love, guys. I appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Good night. Cheers, guys. Don't forget to subscribe to the Frankie Lee Podcast.